Let's take a look at our batting order. It's brought to you by Capital One. Grohovac's left the yard. It looks like Laviolette, who's been dealing with a hamstring injury, got healthy yesterday. A couple hits, including a homer. And Caden Kent's been a big story through the course of this World Series as he plays for the injured superstar, Braden Montgomery. You see his numbers right there. It is warm, as we've told you, about 98 degrees. The wind is uh, blowing a little bit right to left. Van Seacrest, who for the most part during his career has been a midweek starter, has emerged here on the weekend and certainly on this stage. We're almost set for first pitch between Tennessee and A&M with a national championship on the line. Seacrest looks around, makes sure his infield and outfield are where they should be, and he's ready to deliver the first pitch of the winner take all game three and as he does it's in there for a strike. Krohovac is a huge huge kid he's the third baseman only a freshman hitting the buck 82 here in the World Series with a double and a homer. White. A&M was seven outs away on Sunday from winning it all and then the volunteer bats showed up. There is a man who knows all about Omaha, Jim Schlossnagel. No doubt. That's outside. It's two balls and a strike. Took a whole bunch of TCU teams here, and when he did, it was really built by his recruiting coordinator, who happens to be the head coach on the other side, Tony Vitello. Two. Gets the call down low, or even a two and two. And Vitello sends out the same lineup he did. You saw Christian Moore, the second baseman, come out of that game late yesterday. He is in the starting lineup. He is at second base. And Grohovac sends this one down the line in right. It is right along that air foul line. And there is one man out as Kavaris Tears was there to make the play. Wind's going to make a difference tonight. Coming in from right, it's blowing pretty good, and, and when it gusts, it is coming straight in from that right field wall. Probably help keep that ball fair right there and, and not blow it into the stands. Yeah, going to be tough to ride one out of here to right field. This man can do it right here, though. This is the kind of strength that can cut through the wind. 6'6", 230, Katy, Texas. A sophomore at LaViolette, who's likely to break every home run record at A&M. He's got 29 of them already. 72 mile an hour pitch in there for strike one. College baseball, you are allowed to shift, unlike Major League Baseball, so they have three on the right side of the infield. Down. We got umpires wearing microphones, we got umpires wearing cameras. Grady Smith is calling balls and strikes tonight. Hear that take? Jay Slavulette calling ball. Grady Smith did not agree. I I heard. And uh, Xander Seacrest doing what he's been doing for the last five weeks or so, which is just absolutely painting at the bottom of the zone. The one, two. Wait. Two and two. He threw it right where his catcher, Cal Stark, wanted it a little too far outside, testing the zone of the umpire. He will live away to both righties and lefties. You can see. Cal Stark sitting a good six, eight inches off the plate. They're just fine with that one being off. Down. Three balls, two strikes. The hat comes flying off as Xander Seacrest's head. Six and a third against Florida State Wednesday. Three NCAA games started for Seacrest. Two and oh, one oh four. There are his numbers on the full count. Got him there. And there are two down as he catches LaViolette out front, swinging at it. He's been rolling, KP, and the big part of it is ability to decelerate the fastball. The college game has so much turned into a power arm game, but Seacrest has found his niche, slowing the baseball down. You'll see a breaking ball that will be into the upper 60s at times, and LaViolette just couldn't hold the barrel back. Catcher Jackson Appel. He was hurt late in the game. Yesterday, as he looks at a fastball in there, strike one at 87 miles an hour. Out of Houston, Texas, six feet, 200 pounds. 
And one of the many to come through the transfer portal in this game. That one's down. It's one ball and a strike. What I love about Seacrest, too, is he's not a, you know, he's not going to throw a fastball above 90 probably tonight, maybe 91, but yet he uses the fastball very effectively and is not afraid to pound his own with it. Appel on the ground a second more charges he has time and he will make the play good first inning for Seacrest he goes one two three and the balls will come to the plate when we come back. We're going to have teams in the top 25 when we get around to having college basketball the SEC locked and loaded again our Capital One batting order here. Moore, a superstar to start this whole thing off. And then Burke, who's been tremendous. Dryling, right now you can't get him out. No, he's positioned himself. If Tennessee's able to win this one, we talked about Lampkin potentially being the most outstanding player. Certainly Dylan Dryling would be in that mix. He has been so clutch for this team. So is a left-hander. And he's been incredibly clutch during this College World Series. I, coming in, I'm not sure if Texas AM and m knew exactly what they were going to get from Justin Lampkin in his first start. His two starts here, he's got 80 innings, he's punched out 15. It's a low to mid 90s fastball, relies on his slider, good ride on the fastball. You'll see when he's right, that fastball is going to be at the top of the zone, but he hasn't had a string of back to back as good the entire season, really, as he's had here in Omaha. Now, so Sunday, AM used five pitchers. Four of them made their first appearance in the World Series. Both of these teams have just about every weapon they want out of the bullpen. Cortez, who was phenomenal yesterday, will not be available for AM, but for the most part, everyone else is. And this is the all hands on deck game. That guy right there put on a display with his stuff, throwing 101 plus miles an hour consistently. But that was yesterday. This is today. Here's more the second baseman hitting 409 here, here in Omaha. And this is slight tower power. Strike one, a little more velocity coming from Lampkin. Not a Corpus Christi, just a sophomore. This will be one of the names we hear when it comes to the Major League Baseball draft. Two. Lampkin ahead, 0 oh and 2. They set up high and away. Wait. He hit his spot, but it was too far out. One ball and two strikes. I'm going to show you three pitches. He loves to throw the fastball up above the belt and then turn that change up over. He'll throw a back foot slider on top of that as well. That ball is pulled down the line and it is out of here. What a start for the balls as Moore leaves the yard. It's one nothing Tennessee. There is a little bit of that light tower power and we've seen already from Moore in this series. He hit for the cycle the second ever to do it and on that night he added a double and he starts with a two strike shot to left. Uh, Justin Lampkin's been getting everybody out all week with this pitch. The fastball just above the belt. Simo looked like he was hunting it. He gets the barrel to that, the back of that baseball, and when he hits it square, it's a no doubter. The ball's on the board first. Exit velocity of 109 miles an hour. A one, two, three, top half from Sechrist, and now they go up one zip. Burke. Looks at a breaking pitch high, ball one. He is a record holder with 34 and a career mark of 61. He is the emotional leader of this team. And a 1-0, swing and a miss. On the games that Moore hasn't hit, he has been in the middle of everything, and that was the case yesterday as well. Drew a big walk, looked at his bench, and that's what led to the homer. As this one is fouled back. Yeah, I just think a good early sign, too, for the Tennessee bench. They, I'm sure they've been watching film of Lampkin 
all day long and seeing how many guys have come up empty on that fastball up above the belt. And for their leader to launch one to start the gate will give everybody in that dugout confidence. All right, let's see. He's working ahead again, one, two. And that one is into right. That's going to get down. And a couple of pitches left up. One left the building. And now the top two have each gotten a hit. Two pretty good approaches from two of the best hitters in all of college baseball right there. Slider that just kind of hangs out over the plate. Blake Burke keeps that barrel in the zone about as long as anybody in the country. Is it long enough there to hook it down the right field line? Solid contact to start for both Christian Moore and Blake Burke. And already the cheering section for the Orange Rocky Top up, standing, and clapping. Billy Amick is the three hole hitter. He's the third baseman. Amick has been terrific all season, struggling a little bit here in the World Series. Five for 21. That, that's what Lampkin needs, right? He's got to be able to throw his fastball. It's his best pitch. And for him to be able to challenge right there in a 1-0 count and get an uncomfortable swing, that might get him settled in. Left side of the infield, Grohovac Camarillo as they throw behind Burke, who has stolen 11. Caden Kentz at second, Burton, Ted Burton at first with a pill behind the plate. Sorrell, Chestnut, LaViolette in the outfield left to right. Lead off home run Christian Moore as we're just underway at a winner take all game three. Good one there. That's the change up that Lampkin can when he gets on top of it is that good sink. I think the other important thing for Lampkin just because they lean on a fastball early you can't go away from who you are that fastball up is who he is. They've gotten two hits with two strikes. And Lampkin finds himself ahead in the count one and two. Dylan Dryling on deck. He's got a couple of homers here already and a quality at bat nearly every time up. Nobody out. And this one is playable. Here comes the center fielder Chestnut still coming. And now he will stop Burke way off first base. Didn't know if anybody was going to get there, and he retreats. And that brings up a guy who's beginning to cast his name in legendary status for the balls when it comes to World Series. Two homers. They talk about his heartbeat, and yesterday postgame, nobody seems surprised at what Dryling has been able to do. Draft eligible sophomore hitting 422, five homers, 12 RBIs in the tournament. Well, and it was it was this man right here that when the weight of the scoreless game was starting to build, he's the one that busted it open. And they, they, they were just waiting, you could feel it, for somebody to come up with a clutch swing of the bat, and yeah. it was Dryling that delivered. Yeah, he has been captain clutch, did it against Florida State. That one missed. Two balls, no strikes. You watch these games, and you can tell, guys, certain players, their takes on the pitchers are more comfortable than others, and Dryling seems very comfortable. He seemed pretty comfortable with everybody since he showed up. Yeah. About a week and a half ago. Um, been very in control at bats for the most part from Dryland. There's still plenty of power in there. Out of Hayes, Kansas. And a four pitch walk. Means first and second for Hunter Ensley. And with an offense as potent and capable as Tennessee, they got a chance to put a crooked number on the board early. And that's going to bring Max Wiener, the pitching coach for AM, out to talk to Justin Lampkin. Well, Justin Lampkin, we talked about it right from the jump. I mean, this is a guy that has literally carved his way through two appearances 
here at the College World Series has been very low stress. Eight innings, only five base runners. So a leadoff home run. Now you already have two guys aboard. This is not the situation he's found himself in over the last couple outings. And so Max Wiener's got to go out there and slow him down and try to instill the confidence of what they've seen from him his last two times out. That's a critical number. Those two appearances you're talking about both came against the Gators. Against all other SEC teams this season, the ERA is higher than eight. Are there any similarities between Florida's offense and Tennessee's offense that would lead you to think Lampkin can pitch the same way and have the same success or not? Well, I, I, I think there's more diversity and more depth in this lineup. Both of them rely on the home run. But I, I think this Tennessee lineup a little scarier, especially at the bottom part. Here is the junior Hunter Ensley out of Huntington, Tennessee, had one of the highlight reel catches of this World Series early in the week. He's got two on and a first pitch. He swings out and misses on a change up at 83. Home run from Moore to get things jump started. Ensley a 300 average, a homer, three RBIs in Omaha. Pretty good start to this sequence. What do you think the percentage of times is that the pitching coach goes out and all of a sudden things get just locked back in? Seem to get high, better. Very high. And you can tell Ensley's been ready to hit, but not only does he come out and throw two strikes after the meeting, but two strikes with off speed pitches. And Ensley barely caps that second one. And now this is where Lampkin's been, where he slowed the bat down a couple times. This is where that high fastball can really be effective. Well, he'd love to get a ground ball. You saw already here in the first, Josh Stewart is warming in that bullpen. Swing and a miss, and a much better at bat that time for Lampkin as Ensley is gone, and now there are two down. Obviously, the outcome is good there, but I like the pitch calls because so often when guys get excited on the mound, you speed everything up going to home plate. Well, the easiest way to slow you down is if you throw off speed pitches because you have to. Your body has to slow down some. That's three straight, all down and out of the zone. Ensley couldn't hold off of any of them. It's the first strikeout of the night for Justin Lampkin. Well, we learned that from Sechrist in the top of the first. Slow things down. But he went one, two, three. Left on left for Caveras. Tears the right fielder. Swings at the first one, sends this towards foul territory. Grohovac can't see it. And now the shortstop Camarillo's going over, and nobody's gonna get it. The first look from the third baseman was, I have no idea where it is. And then both Sorrell, the left fielder, and Camarillo picked it up. Look at Krahovac right away. He didn't see it. He didn't see it. And this is where that wind does play a factor because it's spinning away. It's going to take it even further away from Alec Camarillo. And the third baseman, Gavin Grohovac, he didn't see it off the bat. And I think Camarillo understood the only guy that's got a chance to make this play is him. He put his head down, but just wasn't able to get there in time. Off the bat, looked like maybe A&M's off the field. Instead, yeah. yep. really dangerous Kavaris Tears still standing there. Yeah. Big foul territory here at Charles Schwab Field, both first and third baseline. Next pitch to Tears, that's down. And we have seen World Series change on fly balls that are not caught in foul territory. Well, and it's, it's always a part of the storyline here on bright, sunny days, the left side of the field, because it is bearing down on that part of the park. Burke is at second, Dryling at first. Nope. That one missed as well. Two balls and a strike. Feels like such a big part of the game. We're only in the first. For both Lampkin to get out of it and Tennessee to add to it. Nope. Tier slow roller getting over there to cover. Lampkin on the underhand flip from his first baseman, Burton. And at least in that mini battle, Lampkin survives. Moore exit stage left to get it going. It's a primetime dude right here. Simo getting a point. We have teams from the same conference meeting in the championship round of this World Series. Six times those teams have been from the SEC, and the winner will give the conference their 16th baseball title and 10th since 2009. It was the Horn Frogs in 2012. They began a pretty good, successful run with Schlossnagel as the head man and Tony Vitello as his assistant. Elander is there as well. And now Vitello and Elander are on the same staff. Tony then went to Arkansas 
And Tennessee loved what he was doing there, so he is now their head man, and they they love him in Knoxville. He is a rock star. As Hayden Shot is up now and looks at a slow pitch in there for strike one. Shots the DH. And he just reached out to serve that in a left field. He will be aboard. Aiden shot with his seventh hit of this World Series. And for all of the power in this AM lineup, and there's plenty of it, nobody has more hits on the year than that guy. Hayden shot the graduate transfer from Columbia, took a first pitch, it was off the plate, but called for a strike. And this time knows he's probably got to protect a little bit more. Lets it travel, shoots it to left for the first hit of the night for the eggs. And shot also has been hampered by a hamstring. On some level, it is amazing that AM has gotten this far, given the injuries to their Saturday starter and their superstar Montgomery, and yet they continue to play well. As that one misses away, 1 0 to Ted Burton, the first baseman. That is Braden Montgomery. We will see him in the major leagues in a couple of years. And that is a massive presence that is not in this lineup. 1 0, this one into left. Heading back, Ensley. He will be there to make the running catch shy of the track. Uh, there is one down. Okay, that's a couple barrels in a row now, and they need Ted Burton to, to drive the baseball. That ball's hit pretty stinking good out there in the left center field. I thought it was going to carry a little bit more, and it just didn't you really did. get going. I thought it got in on him just enough. Mm. Just enough, but yeah, if Ted Burton gets it, he can run it out of here. But. Both approaches this inning right on the barrel for the Aggies. Xander Sechrist has one out. He's thrown 18 pitches. It's not a huge threat to run there at first in shot. Here's the left fielder, Caden Sorrell. And he comes in having a very productive College World Series. So for 360 with the double and a homer. He's just a freshman, and as far as the foundation pieces for the next couple of years, this is going to be one of them at AM. Yeah, this is a kid with a really high ceiling. The body's still got a ton of filling out to do, but he's already made a pretty big splash here in his first trip through the league. It's a massive outfield. And he swings and sends this one to center field. That sends Ensley back. And just like that, if you're going to live on the deepest part of this ballpark. That's a graveyard for baseballs, especially tonight. That's a pretty good night to do it. If you're a fly ball guy and it's heading out towards center field, probably a pretty good chance that guy's going to run it down. Well, and that's just something you don't see the Aggies do a, a whole lot first time through the order. They don't typically make first pitch outs or, or really even offer at the first pitch. So you, you can you can bet Camarillo is going to have a patient at bat right here. Jim Schlossnagel loves to make the pitcher work, especially first time through. Camarillo is the junior shortstop. Just a buck 76. He's got three hits here, and that is in there for a strike at 87. Remember yesterday, there was high frustration for the Volunteers, guys. The leadoff hitter was on base four times in the first six innings. They didn't get a run. Here's A&M with their leadoff man on, and now two down. Camarillo is one of those guys that has had the opportunity to play both at the Little League World Series with the team from Chula Vista and here at the College World Series. The crowd has filled in nicely on a very hot, humid day in Omaha. Temperature still around 98 degrees. Seacrest on a 1 2 set up way outside. That's where he goes. All fastballs in this event, four straight heaters. And all away, mm -hmm. just away, away, away. And, and Secrets may surprise you in late in the count sometime, but for the most part, he's going to try to run everything away from both righties and lefties. 2-2 two, two to Camarillo, 3-2. and two. It's away. The crowd, who didn't have the viewpoint we did, <laughs> including that guy, Tony Fitello, 
see where maybe from a different angle it might look like a strike, but it wasn't. No, that ball's out. And Tony asked Cal Stark what he thought, and Cal Stark verified it to his skipper. That ball's off the plate. Caden Kent on deck on a 3-2, and he got him to chase. Really good start for Xander Sechrist. Ball's got one. They're coming up for the second time when we come back. That's my guy. That's what you want when you coach a team, is you want a guy who's an extension of you on the field. That ball is driven to left field. He's watching so is everyone else. It's out of here. He's a fighter. Uh, he's, he does everything he's asked of, and he's what every teammate wants. The Knoxville native was 0 for 16 before hitting that two run home run yesterday and Vitello gets emotional when talking about him. He says I see so much of myself in him because he's not the best player out there but he's a guy that I trust and for a local kid who grew up watching Tennessee baseball to be able to help his team be one win away from a national championship he told me yesterday was a dream. Yeah, and there they are. They're Stark right behind Vitello who's on the top step. It's 1 0. -oh. Here's Dean Curley. He's the shortstop. And what? that's in there for a strike one and one. Well, and for all the struggles on offense, he's he changed the game yesterday on defense. I mean, the, the back pick yeah. was one of the biggest plays yeah. in the game. And then, oh, by the way, the two run homer to get his back going. Quietly, the freshman shortstops had a massive College World Series as he swings and misses, hitting 368 with a double three RBIs. And you know, the prototypical shortstop now has just gotten bigger and bigger, whether he stays there or not. But he fills the uniform out. Good take. He thought about it. Lamb could try to go backdoor slider right there and close enough that you get an offer on that one sometimes, but a good take by the freshman. Curly Peeble Stark, 7 8 9 here in the bottom of the second, and then back to the top for Moore, who homered to lead off the game. That's way outside as well. And I brought that up KP last half and this is kind of a shirt off day with a fan if you can find one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a old chew on that one big KP don't get any ideas. Yeah. <laughs> it is pure <laughs> joy. Back up the middle what a job by Lampkin to snare that. And there is one down. So KP pitcher you had two on you were kind of on the ropes and they only allowed the home run. How much carryover is there. We do have that axiom in baseball. You better get the pitcher early or he can settle yeah. in. Yeah I mean I think confidence levels way high for Lampkin and, and you get your bell rung with the first guy and then you come back and work yourself out of a jam and, and that gets that confidence level back up. I don't th the environment is not going to wow him today. He's already been out there twice in this tournament and I think he'll I think he'll give him a chance. Anna Peebles the DH she's only had a couple of plate appearances here out of Ashland Virginia at 5 11 a buck 94 and then Stark is on deck they will shift on the infield Caden Kent moves to the shortstop side of the bag <laughs> oh and two that's the one he seems to have the most comfort with right now is yeah. that slider. See if he comes again with it a little lower on the back foot of the righty. No went outside and it's one ball and two strikes. No play. It feels as though and this might have been the plan coming into it. It feels as though since the home run by Moore it's been very off speed heavy yeah. almost as if Max Wiener maybe just feels like they are really come into this game hunting that high fastball 2 2 and now it's three balls and two strikes and, and that would be the book on Lampkin if sure. you're coming in hey yeah. force that fastball down he's going to use it uh, and he's had great success on the fastball this year fastball up guys are hitting about 160 against him they don't get to it very often 3 2 to the eighth hitter who has not yet gotten a hit here in Omaha and he fouled that one off. Peebles back in the lineup at the D.H. after three walks yesterday. He's got four in limited plate appearances here in Omaha. Has not done any damage necessarily from a from a hit standpoint but has found himself on the bag. Yeah. 
Swing and a miss. He pulled a string there, and that's the second strikeout for Lampkin. He's almost using that slider like a changeup. I mean, the velocity difference is enough. The velocity on the, the slider and the changeup are about identical. You can see the dot. It's, it, it didn't come back that no. much, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in that situation. It's, it's the velocity difference in location that gets people's out in front of it. Not a ton of sweep to that slider. But no. like you're saying, KP, from a reaction standpoint, he's just really using it just simply to get him off the fastball and out in front. As Chris Button pointed out, Stark was 0 for 16 before the big fly yesterday, and he starts him off with the ball out. Christian Moore, the leadoff hitter, is on deck. What a thrill it is for Stark out of Knoxville, Tennessee, to be wearing the Vols uniform and trying to get that school its first championship. Interesting that they've gone soft against Stark. That's what he hit out yesterday was a breaking ball from a left-hander. Lampkin trying to post a zero here after one in the first. Aggie fans standing up to support. Interesting, too. They've been living away, away, away to the righties. And they just called a pitch clock violation on Lampkin, so that will be a ball against him. So the count instead of one and two goes to two and two. 20 seconds they have to begin the delivery and throw. Nope. Try to avoid seeing more again if you're Lampkin. Three, two. And that's not a play. Good job by Stark. Must do wonders for a player when your coach sits there and says, that's my guy. He's my guy. You're in an 0 for 16, and he's my guy. Well, Cal Stark took a lot of heat last year because the bat didn't do a ton, but Tony Vitello has made it clear to everybody the defense and the leadership are worth some of the cold spells with the bat. Way inside. That is a walk to Stark. And that will bring Christian Moore back to the plate. Good at bat by the catcher Stark. Good at bat, but that, that pitch clock violation figures into that right there. I would agree. I mean, you add a ball in the middle of it, misses instead of it being 3-2 right now. You walked a nine-hole hitter, and you gotta you gotta deal with this guy with runner on base. My small sample size here in Omaha, but he led off this game with a homer. Danny Higgins was the last to do that for the Tigers in '97 in a championship game. And he hit for the cycle earlier with the double. So let's see if he's that streak guy. Swings at that first one looking for his second. Back and challenge him with a How fastball up to start it right away. Almost the identical pitch he yeah. hit out of the ballpark. Christian Moore will let you know I take this very personally. It's me against that guy out there and I'm going to win it. This one popped up foul territory Burton is there he will make the play and they get more who didn't look like he saw that very well. Charles Schwab. On a distant world. Darkness. The bigs five time all star bounced around and on the teams he was on he made a big time impact. Check out the all star game in 2005. Caden going a little blue lollipop got the Dodgers <laughs> uni on. And here we are from 05 to 24. And uh, for those just watching for the first time, given a championship game, Jeff will not show a ton of emotion. And mom will. And this guy has been phenomenal in the tournament. Got inserted into the lineup when Montgomery went down, and he has been on fire in this tournament. Up he bats eight. Travis Chestnut nine then we go back to the top of the order in a one nothing game in the third. Yeah, it takes a lot off that man that's a it's like a lollipop curve coming in at 71. 
That velocity difference is almost 20 miles an hour between a fastball and that one. Oh. Ouch. That hurt. You can hear him. Ricky, as a hitter, is it uh, is it is it easy or impossible to adjust to a pitch if you're sitting fastball and it's 71 miles an hour? Can you lay back and still get that? Yeah, you definitely can. You you just have to really set your sights on letting the fastball get deep. So that's why when people talk about facing guys that are crafty and guys that can really slow the ball down, everybody talks about hitting the fastball the other way because you really have to bring your contact point almost inside your front foot so that you don't get caught fishing on that off speed stuff. The one two. And that's fouled straight back. And this one is to left center field, and it is hanging up there, and a nice running catch for Dylan Dryling. Hit pretty well by Kent, but it hung up there and blew towards the left fielder. And that ball had double in the gap written all over it when it left Caden Kent's bat, but Dylan Dryling saw it off the bat, and as you said, Ravi, the wind just rides it right back to him. This Tennessee outfield defense has been spectacular here in Omaha, and Dylan Dryling Taking another extra base hit away there with a fantastic read in the gap. So Kent retired. And that is four in a row for Xander Sechrist as Travis Chestnut comes up. Good. Breaking pitch in there for a strike to the outfielder who's hitting the buck 54 out of Pflugerville, Texas. He's just 5'7, 155. Tennessee really anticipating the bunt for a hit here. Blake Burke is over and in. Billy Amick almost on the grass. And you see Burke, he's over because he's trying to take away that push bunt. You can tell they have prepped for what they're going to do if there's a push bunt. Burke's going to go for the ball, and Sechrist is going to have to beat him to the bag. Late one and two. Sechrist doesn't hit the white of the plate very much. It's I mean if he misses he's just missing off there's not too many that are in the middle third of the plate that he has thrown yet today. How about really? a little two strike bunt really safe at first and they throw it away. He's got to head to second a two strike bunt from Chestnut and he is in scoring position. You don't see that very often that was awesome a two strike bunt for a hit the defense obviously once they get to two strikes they're out of there nobody bunts for a hit with two strikes are you kidding me chestnut drops this down softly kind of in no man's land and really cal stark needs to put that one in his back pocket chestnut one of the fastest players in college baseball once you have to run that far and throw it out of control you're never going to throw him out blake burke couldn't get there because chestnut was between him and the baseball and that's an extra 90 feet on an ill-advised throw. That is <clears throat> that is a circle at, at bat. 100%. Right there. Wrote it down, circle, bunt. Now Grohovac. Ball one, and the hat flies off of Secret's head again. The third or fourth time he's had to pick it up and put it back on. It's a pretty violent head snap with Secret. It's a non-traditional move with his head as he comes through the release point that hat just it has a hard time staying on with that big league salad he's got rocking seventh bunt for a hit by the guy behind him he's going to third on the off speed pitch the throw down and he is at third base Travis Chestnut's speed and wheels have paid off and that was a really good job, by the way, by Amick yes. to make sure it didn't go into left field. Yeah, Amick, Amick turns into a catcher at this point. Just block it and make sure it stays in front of you, because if that gets by with the speed of Chestnut, I mean, he, he can somersault home at that point. But he has changed the game with his feet in this third inning. 18 stolen bases now on the year. Krahovac swings and misses. It's one and two. When the fan bases are engaged, we get some real noise in the stadium right now. Chestnut has gotten everybody fired up. Infield plays back. 
Novak trying to make contact. Wait. How about it, guys? I mean, when's the last time you've seen a two-strike bunt? Can't, not not for a you hit. Know, that worked. Yeah, I know, for a hit. Not for a hit. I, I, I honestly can't remember one. You may see it on a sack that they get yeah. on. Oh, yeah. But no. Rahovac hits that over the head of Amick. And Chestnut's going to score. It is one to one. Gavin Grahovac drives him in. All right, first time all year that AM has bunted with two strikes, and it totally changed the offensive field. Chestnut gets on, uses his legs, and Grahovac does what he's done all year, just fires one to left. KP, you talked about Seacrest didn't throw a whole lot of balls in the middle of the plate. That one was a changeup that caught way too much of the plate, and the Aggies manufacture one with some really good baseball. And just a little the most flat start for them. That has changed. Here's Slaviolette, and he looks at strike one. Another one that caught a little more of the plate than Cal Stark wanted. He set up outside. For Grohovac, his 66th run batted in on the season. He gets the call on the corner. Good pitch. Game one of the series in which they won 9 5. Eight of the nine runs that they scored, AM, came on two strike swings. Yeah, big thing, theme of game one is AM take advantage of poorly executed two strike pitches. 0 oh, 2 and a spoil there by LaViolette. I think sometimes, KP, we've talked about this a lot. Like sometimes you can be too much of a strike thrower. Yeah. And you got to yeah. be able to learn when you're ahead in the count to stretch the zone and try to force these hitters to not chase because these guys are too locked in. You make a mistake with two strikes, they are going to make you pay. 29 home runs on the season for La Violette. And a little squibber. First base unoccupied. They go to second, safe at second base. There was no play at first base, and Burke decided to go to second for the force, and everybody's safe. There are times, and I'm not, I don't know if Christian Moore can make this play or not, but there are times that Burke just goes too far. At this point, with a lefty on the mound, if he fields that ball, you are not getting it out at first base. The only chance that you would have is if Christian Moore can charge in and make that play, but with Burke, once you glove it, the only chance you have is to go to second. There's no way, but you do it again, it's probably a good one to stay home on. Right. Christian Moore came in there and, and was talking to the dugout. He thought the ball hit LaViolette on the swing. Doesn't look like we're going to get a review. I did not think it did live. No. 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 It's interesting, too. That That's the first time all night that Seacrest has intentionally thrown fastball in. And it was executed yeah. well. He put it exactly where he wanted to. Laviolette just hit it in a place that they couldn't do anything with it. Longtime pitching coach Frank Anderson in the seventh year will come on out. What a quirky inning offensively. A two-strike bunt. And then a steal of third after the error. A Grahovac single, a Laviolette single that probably had an exit velocity of about 42 miles an hour. And no play as it was a Bermuda Triangle hit between Sechrist and Burke. Yeah, and, and Moore's playing deep. Laviolette's such a powerful left-handed hitter. Moore's playing deep. I, I just don't know with how well Laviolette runs if that ball gets to Moore. I, I don't, I don't think know they if get it does or not. Yeah. <laughs> My point is, with Burke making that play, that was it. you eliminate right. the play at first That's base. Right. You fully eliminate it because nobody can get back to it. That sets it up for Jackson Appel. The Hovac is at second, LaViolette is at first. The first real jam for Sechrist. Good. 
So again, it wasn't a big hit, but it was a two strike hit for Laviolette. Back up the middle. Moore will take it himself. Go to first. And a pretty play. Double play. Christian Moore. And that will end the inning. How about Travis Chestnut laying down a two strike punt coming around to score? We're heading bottom three of a 1 1 championship game. The idea behind it in a podcast that he had put together was that when something bad happens, there's always something good that comes out of it. And Jim Schlossnagel has used that with his team this year. You didn't get the job you want? Good. It gives you a chance to work harder. And so even for yesterday, when he got up on the podium after the game, it was, you lost that game? Good. It gives you a chance to play the game that you love one more day. We're not looking at this as we have to play another game. It's we get to play another game. Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. And that's uh, the same echo by Vitello and Tennessee. What an opportunity for these guys to be on this field in a winner take all showdown. First pitch away. This is a championship game for two schools that have never won a baseball championship. And there is such tradition and pride in these programs. As Ryan McGee said at the top, hard to believe that that hasn't happened yet. Burke rips this one to the gap. And it's going to get over the head of the center fielder. And Chester had no chance. That thing was ripped. And a double for Blake Burke to lead off the bottom of the third. Well, that's another fastball that Tennessee gets the barrel to. This ball is absolutely compressed. A fastball right around the belt again. Blake Burke, as flat as you can move the barrel, centers that one up and cuts it through a 15-mile-an-hour wind into center field. The ball's got the leadoff man on in scoring position. No chance for Chestnut to get it. And here is Amick. Be a good answer for the Vols after AM scored their first run of the game. You notice anything with uh, Amick swing? Because he's been so good all year. He looks in between to me. The, you know, yesterday there was a lot of taking. Today, the fact he comes up there and swings and misses a first pitch off speed pitch, I think is actually a good sign that he's at least ready for the fastball. Grounder and now in contact, heading to third is Burke. They will throw across the diamond and Camarillo will get him out. That's a pretty good read by Burke right there. Because <clears throat> it's just, it's reading ultimately where Grohovac started at third base and what his break was. Because generally, ball to your right right there, you're not going to go. But knowing that there's no chance Grohovac can get back to third base, his his baseball knowledge is is off the charts good. Sometimes it's too good uh -huh. when he's at first base, but it's little stuff like that. He doesn't run great, runs fine, but, but that's still great. Yeah, that's, that's just a really base. good that's yeah. a really good baseball play. Puts himself in position now to score on a sack fly, and here's Dryling, who walked his first time up. He's been their best hitter, and he sends that one back. Yeah, I think Blake Burke, he, he plays the game with a fearlessness. You see it on defense that he's not thinking about messing up. He's thinking about making a play. And it, as you said, KP, even though he's not a burner, he reads balls very well. And that one is a great example of kind of a tweener ball that allows him to get to third. So the numbers there, he's been a doubles machine, and that one is a little bit in. What did he tell us before the game? You had asked him about his, uh, his telling Vitello, challenge the play, challenge the play. And he was right a couple of times yesterday. And then he said, but I'm usually terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm never good all year, but <laughs> might have got him to 50%. He was two, two for two, two yesterday. <laughs> he's also he's got 11 stolen bags. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, it's not going to be credit as a stolen base. Yeah. It's just as good as a stolen base right there. It's a base very few people would have taken. Infield back on the right side. Grohovac even with the bag. 2-1 pitch on the way to Dryling, and he swings. He was way out in front of it. Well, that gives you some information right there, KP. You're right, Ravi. He was way out in front. The body was moving forward. The bat was way out in front. And now they bring the middle infield and everyone else in. Trying to cut down Burke if he comes on contact. This one is driven to center field. Chestnut still going back. 
now under it. And that is the base running beauty of what Burke just did. He comes in to score on the sack fly. Back on top go the balls. Well, that's a professional A-B right there, KP, because we just talked about how he looked fooled, yet he makes an adjustment. Fastball away, just behind it. Takes the breaking ball up right here. Spits on the one inside, way out in front, probably thinking he's getting a fastball, but goes back to a two-strike approach. Right on time for a breaking ball that catches too much of the play. Yeah. And that is another professional at bat with a runner in scoring position from Dylan Dryland. Ninth RBI of the World Series for Ding 2 1 Vols. Base is clear, two down, Hunter Ensley. One strike. This Tennessee program has been the best there is in the country since 2020. They have won more games, got a higher winning percentage than anybody else. And this year they have been late at number one and dominant when it comes to hitting a long ball. And man, have they have they grown the crowd and the enthusiasm for baseball in Knoxville? No, oh, it's Tony Vitello. He had a hundred million dollar stadium coming. If that tells you anything. Here's the one two to Ensley and this one is over the head of Kent served into right field and a two out two strike hit for Hunter Ensley. Keep the inning going. Same approach there as they did the first time up against Ensley. It was four off speed pitches a couple sliders and a couple change ups back to back and you see this time Ensley had seen three in a row recognized off speed stayed back shoots it to right center for a two out single. That brings up the very dangerous Kavaris tears. We've seen him play both center and right. And he is an absolute glove wherever he is. A couple of phenomenal plays that he can leave the yard with one swing. <laughs> He's all one of the five guys that have got 20 home runs. It is hard to fathom in college baseball that you have multiple 20 home run guys, let alone five of them. Ripped and that is past Kent. Hensley will put the brakes on. Back to back hits with two down for Tennessee. Well, you got to wonder, KP. We, we see some action down in that AM bullpen. How long do they stick with Lampkin? The stuff, especially the fastball, just doesn't look like it has the finish to it that we've seen from him. So far here in Omaha his first two starts here in Omaha eight innings four hits allowed walk one struck out 15. Tonight he's already given up five hits and, and they haven't really been cheap now they've been hard hit. He's got two strikeouts. And the length of the Tennessee lineup. Brings Dean Curley the shortstop. Call time with about four seconds on their pitch clock. They're going to get him. Yeah, I think they're taking him out. If, if they're going to wait that long and then call time and, and have Appel walk out there, I would assume that Jim Schlossnagel is probably the next one walking that way. The, the pitching plan today for the Aggies was was Lampkin, you know, potentially through four, maybe Stewart for two, and then give the ball to Oshenbeck. And that that certainly has been sped up here if they're already going to go. To the right handed slider ball specialist Josh Stewart here in the third. That's what it looks like is going to happen as the home plate ump goes out and he looks over his shoulder and he sees the head coach of the Aggies coming to get his starting pitcher with two outs in the third inning. Bosnagel said something to Tears as he goes back for an offensive huddle, which put a smile on Tears' face. Lampkin done the big righty coming in Stewart. We'll come back here on ESPN the men's championship game three winner takes it home. Not all Caitlin Clark's are the same. Caitlin Clark city planner. 
Just like not all internet providers are the same. Don't settle. You want fast, get fast. You want reliable, get reliable. You want powerful, get powerful. He is responsible for the guys on base. He grew up an A&M fan. He knows how special it is to be here as they make their first trip to the finals. What will we see from Stewart and how does that figure with the offense he's facing? Well, historically, we thought we'd see a lot of sliders. That's kind of what Stewart has been this year, is throwing more sliders and fastballs. In this College World Series, at times he's pitched a little bit backwards when he needs to, but the slider is definitely his best. All right, so the first bullpen arm in, okay. and that is inside to Curley. One thing to watch, Tennessee is the fourth best average against sliders of any team in, in Division I baseball. So if they go hunting sliders, it usually works out all right. Right down the middle with a fastball at 92. Max Wiener knows that, and he knows that it's a team that's very prepared and isn't afraid to sit on a breaking ball, and that's what KP said. Don't be surprised if he challenges with the fastball and sees if Tennessee's sitting slider. 1-1. One, one. There is the slider too far down and away to Curley, the shortstop. He hit one back to Rampkin and was thrown out at first base. Ensley and Tears, they're both on second and first, each with a two-out single. Curly rips one into left field. That is stung. That's going to bring Ensley in. Heading to third is Tears. Heading into second. And trying to get into a rundown is Curly. He is tagged out. But Dean Curley will knock in the third run of the game as the balls add to it on a Curly RBI. Fourth here in Omaha. Through three. 3-1 three balls. Kind of hangs out and out over the plate. And we talked about reading swings and reading takes. It looked like he was hunting that slider, and when he got a mistake, he made him pay. Dean Curley's got eight hits in Omaha. He's a freshman. He has been terrific. The lead is two as we go to the fourth. Aiden shot, Ted Burton, Caden Sorrell. For a little bit more comfortable with a three, a two-run lead. And Sechrist has been very efficient tonight. Right at the shortstop. Curly fires over to first, and there's one quick out. What do you make of the ball shortstop? His size, his ability to hit the baseball, stays it short? Is he a foundation piece there? Does he move around, give it his size? Uh, you, you wonder, at this age, that size, it would usually project towards third base. You just wonder if laterally he's going to be able to have the range that he needs to. What I'm blown away by is two things. Number one is arm strength. But number two, just how mature his at-bats are. As big and strong as he is, he does not come unglued very often. Does a really nice job, especially in run scoring opportunities. You, you would think he would let it loose a little bit more for such a young, strong kid, and he really has a mature approach. 6-3, final over California. 0-1 oh, to Ted Burton. Wait. One of the primary differences between Tennessee and everybody is they hit more home runs, but it's certainly a, a fairly glaring example, at least here in Omaha, what we've seen from these two teams. The power, the length of the Volunteers' offense, and the fact that, for the most part, especially on a night like this, AM's going to have to put the ball in play and get some runners on. And Braden Montgomery's absence is a big no part doubt. of that. It's massive, no doubt. Quick pitch right there. Sped that lower half up before he came home. Yeah, the scare factor with this Aggie lineup just just different without Braden Montgomery. There's no other way to put it. Nope. A take right there because those hands started from Burton. And there's so much glove side movement on that breaking ball. Just read that it was going to fall down and out of the zone. Really good take. Put the brakes on. Full count. Nope. And that's a walk. 
Burton heads to first. Dalton Connect's going to hear his name in the NBA draft, the 78th annual draft. Now a two-day event. First round Wednesday at 8 on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN Deportes. And there is Connect's head coach. He's heading to the draft. Second round Thursday, 4 Eastern on ESPN. The Hawks have the first pick. Who will they take Wednesday, 8 Eastern time on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN Deportes? Peyton Manning, Rick Barnes, the head hoop coach there. I got to go talk to Rick Barnes. They, they knocked my Blue Jays out this year. He had a hell of a team. I know Creighton did too. Creighton, Creighton had success against the eventual national champions. Josh Heupel sitting right in front of them as well. Pretty excited about football. I think they landed a, you got a portal guy today, an offensive lineman. Did I read that? I think that was just a, a high school kid, but. I was a high school let's, kid. Let's, okay. go back got to, a let's go back to talking about the Creighton basketball game. I don't even that. know why I brought that up. <laughs> It was, it was a sore <laughs> subject between you and I for a little bit. Ugh, I, I kind of liked it. There's that off speed pitch to Sorrell, and he couldn't pull the trigger. I'll tell you one thing, the defense that Rick Barnes' basketball team played, oh, we, we got some surgery going this? on. He does it all. Oh, Talked about it yesterday. Not a whole lot of time to get that one right right now. Another slower one in there, and Sorrell swings and misses. I was going to say, the defense that Barnes' basketball team plays has been similar to the way that the outfield defense has been playing here. <laughs> Smothering, locked down. It's a Ty Ziegler and company. Going two to Sorrell. Was well, Williams team? They had a heck of a season as well. Yeah, that's another team play some defense now. They can play defense. Their backcourt can score with the best of them. Oh, and two. He's been out in front of a slow breaking pitch. Burton comes back as he throws over again. And they are paying a lot of attention to Ted Burton over there. And there, it's not like they're trying to let anybody get hot in the bullpen. They're just feel like they got something, I guess. Double digits and stolen bases. Ten not going here. That misses away. Yeah, it was brought up that Tennessee's pitchers, they don't pay a ton of attention to base runners. And it was something that was emphasized early by AM publicly as well. And since then, they've, they've certainly paid a lot more attention. There it is again, 74 miles an hour, and Sorrell goes down swinging. See, Chris has done such a good job today with that breaking ball of, of starting it in the zone, but there is so much horizontal movement to it. I mean, that starts maybe on the inside part of the plate. And by the time it's done, it's, I mean, six, eight inches at least down and off the plate. There's just nothing you could do once those hands start. That's what you call a sweeper right there. Yeah. That thing covered the, the entire plate and then some. Two down, Ali Camarillo. And shortstop bats. Burton goes back. How slow does it look? Because I think on television, a lot of people will look at that sweeper at 74, and it feels really slow. But from a hitting perspective, is it the speed of it? Is it the movement? What is the challenge in hitting it? It's both. It's it's the ball's moving 15 miles an hour. I mean, he had just thrown an 88 mile an hour fastball, right? So that was 74 mile an hour sweeper, 14 miles an hour difference. In real time, is we're talking hundreds of a second. It's not as big a deal as you would think. But it is slower, and then you got to think about the fact that it's running away from the left-handed bat, and you put those two together, it's just a really hard pitch to deal with. Got a chance to talk with the head man of the a and Aggies, Jim Schlossnagel. Chris Budden will ask him about the pitching decision early, maybe, to get Stewart in, and what the plan will be as this game moves along. Talk about another ballpark that's going to have a big time renovation, too. Uh -huh. Blue Bell there. 0 oh 2. We go off speed to Camarillo. We throw back to first against the guy that has stolen 
three bases and three attempts against left handed pitchers. Aiden Kent is on deck. He hit a rope to left center the driving track down. Runner will go. They got him picked. Throw is a little high. Did the hand get in or not? They say safe. The throw from Burke looked like he tried to make it too perfect and it sailed on him a little bit. I thought he babied it a little bit. I, it did not look like Burke let this one rip. And you're right, it did sail. For whatever reason, he just kind of hung on to it and didn't rip it. That's a little bit of a guy to throw. And great job by Burton of sliding. Well, can get to the back of the base. When you get picked off, you have got to get to the back edge of the base. And then stay it on. Because Christian Moore kept that tag on him just in case he came off at all. So the at bat changes for Camarillo. Missed outside. We've seen them steal third base once with Chestnut. And now AM looks for a two out, two strike big hit. I got you. Out of play. Well, credit AM for going. I mean, the, the, the Vols guessed right, but the reality is the move wasn't fast. And even if you get picked off, if you go first movement against a left handed pitcher, you can still make it. Schloss knows he's got to manufacture runs, and the running game has done that to this point. Cal Stark has only thrown out five of 41 base stealers this year. And so it, it shouldn't be a surprise if AM's going to take chances. Another one out of play. And they've taken a bunch of chances. 26 times this year, the Aggies have attempted to steal third. 22 times they've been successful. Yeah, from a percentage standpoint, the Aggies are one of the best run game teams in the country. They don't steal a ton, but they are highly successful. Our game yesterday was one zip into the seventh. Runs have been kind of hard to come by in this series. Every one of them is huge. Camarillo, a bouncer, fielded cleanly by Moore. He takes his time, and they will strand the runner. Good job again by Sechrist. Frustration for the Aggies down 3-1 when we come back, bottom four. Take him out when you're dead. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, he just not as crisp, you know, which I expected. Hope the win could keep some balls in the ballpark, but Burke's hot. Um, you know, they have a good team. You, know, you can't, you can't, you really got to be on your A game most of the time. You could drop the pitching perfectly. How would it go? Uh, Stewie to give us two more innings and us to score. 17 runs. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds reasonable. Appreciate it, coach. Yeah. Good. Guys. 17 spot. He's looking for the old 1-7. That's, that's all we're asking she, for. She here. did ask if he could draw it up. Yep. You know. Yeah. You're going to give me the pen. That's what I'm going to do. Evan Oshenbeck is already warming as we're here in the fourth. He has been the extraordinary Guy at the back end of the bullpen for AM all season long. Stopper of the year. ERA, it's hard to find. He's been so effective. 0 oh 1. This is Cannon Peebles. That is a strike right down the middle at the letters. 0 oh 2. That Blake Burke comment right there from Schloss took me back to the SEC tournament. D didn't didn't Corpse call him Will Clark? Yeah. And then and then finished it with I'm, I'm kind of ready to never see him again. Yeah. I think by the time Grohovac and Lobulette run their course here in, in Aggie Land. A few others saying the same thing yeah. about them. The rest of the Southeastern Conference is going to be ready for them to move on as well. Lobulette, 50 homers in two seasons. Got a chance to be the all time record holder by the time it's all said and done in Southeastern Conference history. Well, that was a good look from behind there of Stewart Slider and how much it moves. And he's a pretty imposing figure on the mound. Now you get to game three of the World Series and you've played all these games these teams have played. This is this is kind of new territory for the number of pitches and how often they are used. One two. 
two and two. And you can just feel it, and we felt it every year we're here in Omaha. These guys laying it on the line. There is no tomorrow. No, I mean, that's why Evan Aschenbeck's playing catch right now in the fourth yeah. inning. We don't have a weekend game. We don't have a midweek game. This is it. And for a guy that's been used as often as Stewart has recently, every pitch matters. So the foul balls off the bat, Peebles helping the rest of the balls and getting into that pen even further. And Aschenbach can give you length. He's not going to wow you with 98. And yeah. He will fool you with everything else. We're in the bottom of the fourth, and it's 3-1 Tennessee. He's the leadoff hitter. Peebles followed by Stark, and then Christian Moore. Three on the right side of the infield, and that ball is sky high. The wind is kind of playing with it. It's heading to the seats, and it will just sneak in about five rows deep. And a good catch by a fan out there. And I like the move by Schloss to have Oshenbeck ready. I mean, the reality is you can't let this offense get much further away from you. No. Because Tennessee has some guys in the bullpen. They've got lined up ready to go, too. So already a two-run deficit. you got the top of the order looming here in this inning. And it wouldn't shock me if there's some traffic here in this one. If He'll they start heating up. Yeah. Right back at you off the glove. Still plenty of time. And thrown out at first base is Peebles. So Tony Vitello, he's, he's, he's a man of the people. He's a man of Bryce Harper, who's rooting for Tennessee in the College World Series as he showed up at the ballpark the other day wearing the orange tee. And they may be feeling the Vitello vibes tonight. Harper, in his game against the Tigers, is only three for four with five RBIs, including a three-run shot. So he, he's doing his job. A jersey has a carryover effect. <laughs> Country music folks also very involved. We got Morgan Wallen in the house. Their church was here yesterday. Swing and a miss at a high stroke from Stark. Oh, they, they, they have the same jersey, him and Bryce Harper. Right out of the uh, Vitello closet. He's got a. I guess so. He sends them out, maybe. <laughs> Do me a favor. Fire that up. Slider there. Stark behind 0 2. Cal start getting a steady diet of that big breaking ball. But no signs that Stewart doesn't have his best stuff today. That breaking ball, other than the one to Curly, the breaking ball looks really sharp. Cal Stark 6 1 200, Knoxville, Tennessee. Weatherford College before he got here. He's got a 1 2 count. Hit one over the wall yesterday. And the little bleeder into right. Will it stay up there? LaViolette got a good run on it. And I'm not sure. A couple of days ago, he's able to make that play. He was really struggling with his hamstring. Yeah, he's moving just fine. I mean, he ended up, he played some center field yesterday, which we've seen LaViolette do before. But when he is healthy and he's looking more healthy, he is a plus defensive outfielder. Stole a home run earlier in this College World Series. There it comes on. To get the second out in this inning, two quick outs in the inning for Stewart. Now you face more with nobody on. Right at the knees, really good pitch to Moore, who had a homer his first time up. And he popped out to first in foul territory. Be a memorable World Series numbers wise, trying to cap it off with a ring. He liked that pitch, but he. Fouled it back. It's 0 2. Boy, and how big would this be for the Aggies if they could get out of here without any damage? Because when you're facing this dude, when he walks up to bat, he's in scoring position. He got it going here right out of the gate for the balls with a rocket into the bullpen. They've added a couple more cents. Finds himself down 0 2 here. Swing and a miss. Good job. You're right. 
Stewart stuff looks pretty pretty powerful so far. Tennessee's got a 3-1 lead as we're playing in this championship game. You want more coverage of the NCAA Men's College World Series? Go to NCAA.com, your official online home for all 90 NCAA championships. And a good opportunity to thank you to everybody here in Omaha. They welcome you with open arms, whether it's restaurants or walking across the bridge, playing golf with some longtime friends. We really appreciate the way that we are treated as a company here in Omaha. We're in the fifth of the game three winner take all first pitch slow one in there a little high it'll be Kent and then Chestnut. He's the guy that bunted with two strikes and scored the only run of the game for Texas A&M. The Aggies have four hits. It has cooled by three degrees it's now reading ninety five comfortable foul straight back and that one stung stark folks in the outfield seats might not think it's so comfortable yeah, especially in left field where the sun is yet to begin to set right field starting to cool a little bit in the shade <laughs> Get up underneath that chest protector. No, it's still got a piece of it, thankfully. One and two men. Here we go. We've got 36 home runs in this series now, which breaks the mark we had last season. It's a ballpark that when it first opened back in 2011, there wasn't a lot of balls leaving the ballpark. It was virtually impossible. And now it has played much more fair. Ball's a little different, bat's a little different. And it has flown out of here 36 times, including Christian Moore's shot early this one. On a one-two, Kent gone. Boy, Sanders Sechrist is pitching really well, doing what he's done all tournament. That strikeout number four. Yeah, but again, the approach almost exclusively away, 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 and then just a little further away when he gets to two strikes. That actually looked like the slider. That was 80 miles an hour, so a little bit more, not quite as much sweep to it, but enough to get it off the plate and get another strikeout. So coming in his last five starts Tennessee is five and zero oh in those games he had given them twenty nine and a third allowed four earned runs that's a one twenty nine ERA and he had gone at least six in four of those five starts. Nope. Talk about like a bullpen rester a guy that keeps the other team from scoring he has been a superstar for them. And yesterday he may have contributed to the home runs. So yesterday when they were unable to get anything going they had all the runners on he then took a seat near the team's bathroom. <laughs> so he switches spots to get things going. Oh goodness. Yeah. Yeah. It matters. The Chris. team. It matters. The things pitchers do. Dryling homer. Significant. The next inning he says I'm going to go sit back there again. Another Good home point. run. Has to be a thing. <laughs> Mind over matter. If they believe it, then it's true. Good. Well, and it's not just that he's been so good, it's the spots he's been so good in. So you, you talk about the SEC semifinal against Vanderbilt, the regional clincher, the super regional clincher, then the game that pitched Tennessee into the finals. He's been dealing, but he's been dealing in the biggest of moments. Yeah. Wasn't going to think about it, was he? Bunting again with two strikes. Burke and Amick were both even with the bag, just in case. This is that big old curveball. That's the one that's about 15 miles an hour off what the fastball is. 
the velocity difference and that late sink both enough to get it off the bat of Travis Chestnut. Now back to back strikeouts in the fifth for Seacrest. Back to back strikeouts and now we get back to the third time through the order. So here is Grahovac. He hit a ball hard in the left his last time up. He flew out to right his first time up. Wait. And anytime you kind of get to that third time through the order, that generally signals to the staff to get somebody ready. And it's Nate Sneed who did pitch in yesterday's game. Interesting. Don't you think, Kyle, for him to be down Just there playing catch on, on the mound? Yeah, I mean, he's playing catch on the mound. He's, he's getting ready to come in the game. It's interesting too for Seacrest first time second time through, third time through the order the numbers don't change a whole lot 247 261 243 the stuff holds pretty good you go back out there again that one was in that buffer zone he got it call for a strike he tried it again that time it's a little too far you go 2-2. Two, two. Close, little low, and he did not swing. We've seen a few of these from the Aggies. The ability to put on the brakes late, and this thing is just off the inside edge, and the strength of Grohovac to hold that barrel back. Called strike three. Instead of that slider, it's a fastball down the middle, and Grohovac is not happy. That guy is. He's retired five in a row, and he struck out the side. Um, he's a quirky fella, so I'm just going to go with, I assume this is, you know, what he's got for us. Quirky but fiery. In an ideal world, how much length can he give you, and then where would you turn? Uh, most likely Sneed would be next. Uh, Loy and Kirby are two lefties that could follow suit with him, but more than likely Sneed would be next, and, you know, we're getting there pretty close. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Guys? Berkey is a former volley. You want to talk about what uh, Vitello has done there, given the number of wins he's got, the idea that if you build a successful program, they will come, and what now the ball baseball program, where it fits in in Tennessee sports landscape? Well, I mean, you've seen it doing yeah. all the basketball yeah. games you do. One thing Tennessee's fan base has proven, that if you build them a winner, they're going to show up in big-time numbers, and you got to give everybody involved a bunch of credit. Tony has put together a world-class staff. He's recruited an incredibly talented roster, and the administration's continued to add on and upgrade the facility, put all that together, and, and Tennessee finds himself here in three out of the last four years. Good answer. Thank you. Burke hits a hard one again. This one to left, and boy, that's a tough play by Caden Sorrell. He had to go back, then look straight into the sun. Blake Burke seating the ball well. I would say we're comfortable at the plate right now for Mr. Burke. Last two of bats, 111 off the plate. This one, 107, and a great job by the freshman who now is getting a little bit more acclimated to this ballpark. Give him 15 minutes, it some won't be an issue, but still was right there. On off the bat, looked like that was probably extra bases. Yeah, and they got Sorrell playing, I don't know, 10, 15 feet from the track. I mean, you pretty much have to hit it out of the ballpark to get over his head. This one is not getting out of the ballpark. It's on the infield. Burton gives way to Kent. Second baseman makes the play. And there's two quick outs. That's a bit of a helper for Stewart. Game changer. Sorrell making that play. And then you get a first pitch pop up. And Stewart continues to impress here. Well, now you're getting to the time of the game where Oshenbeck can take you home. But I think you got to bring him into the fourth inning. That's asking a lot to, yeah. to finish the game for AM. Every out that Stewart can get and keep this a two run game is one less out that Aschenbach has to get. Because when Jim Schlossnagel brings him in, and he will bring him in, the intent is you're, you're out there to finish this one. Dryling. And this one is heading towards the dugout, and it is just out of the reach of Grohovac. But a Tony uh, Vitello liking Grohovac size to a uh, Ford F-150. <laughs> it's like so big, it's like watching a truck out there. That is a grown man for any 
grade, but especially for a freshman. I mean, are you kidding me? Imagine high school pitchers pitching to him last year. That Not comfortable. <laughs> Wait. Away to Dylan Dryling. A walk and a sacrifice. 336 on the season. 22 home runs. They move three on the right side. And popped up. He's running a lot. Grahovac still looking, and no one's going to get to that. And it spins away. And that will allow Dryling to hustle into second base with a slide. And a double, a little blooper with the infield all shifted. Nobody had a chance to get it. Yeah, no, we talked about it earlier. They're playing deep. That's how they were able to get to the, the ball from Burke. But this is, we talked about the freshman Sorrell out there just not paying attention to the bounce. A ball sliced off the bat of a left-hander will often bounce towards the line. Sorrell maybe took that hop for granted, thinking it was going to be a Sunday hop right to his belly. And as it spins sideways, Dryling's able to take second base. Funny game, isn't it? Burke F7, Dryling double. Right. And made a great catch on the F7, but now a single will give them a 4-1 lead. And it's Ensley who did single his last time up. First base is open. The ball is down and away. It was 107 off the bat, out. <laughs> yes. 68 off the bat, <laughs> double. It will drive you crazy. Can Ensley deliver with two outs? This one is to right field. LaViolette going back, now stopping, and he will not deliver the run from second. Stewart did his job as we head to the sixth inning here of the winner take all game. There's a whole bunch of emotion in a hot. Even what's been the most consistent today is the break of it. Six strikeouts in a day for Seacrest. The vast majority have, have come on that one. Just the inability to lay off of it. That last one, a slider against Caden Kent. Coming off a 1 2 fifth inning where he struck out the side. He'll get Lobby let to start. First pitch, he swings at it, and there's just been very little hard contact so far from the Aggies against the off speed lefty. It's maybe one of those situations, Berkey, you're a hitter for AM. You want to see Seacrest out of the game? You know, they're looking. Definitely. He made it, made it fairly clear like they're not going to wait too long. No, I think it's fascinating. It, it, theoretically, it makes sense to go from the soft lefty to the That's fireball right, right hander, so. right? I mean, it, it makes sense. But I think for the Aggie lineup, they probably feel more comfortable off Sneed than Seacrest at this point. No. No. He called it a ball again, did LaViolette. And the umpire twice now, when he's called it a ball, has then said that's a strike. You ever heard a guy do that? <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah. I, I think there's more guys that do that than you think, but it, it's pretty heady stuff from a sophomore. That's a guy that feels pretty secure about the strike zone. <laughs> it's also the second time they've tried to do that to Lobby Lutt. Away, 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 and then surprise in with the fastball late. Fifty career home runs, second most in program history. And here's the one-two to him. No, no. That just missed. <laughs> Off-speed pitch. He picks up another strikeout. Laviolette's gone. That's four in a row for Xander Sechrist. Ravio loved this. Sechrist, who grew up in the suburbs outside of Atlanta, I asked him growing up, who did you watch? Who did you want to model your game after? And he said, Tom Glavin. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You were born in 2002. <laughs> there is no chance you were in diapers when Tom Glavin was pitching. He goes, true for the most part. But then I got to see him in person make a rehab a start in the minors, fell in love with him there, would watch videos. Yeah. But for the most part, was still in diapers yeah. and a pacifier when Glavin played. Right. Well, that, that was an inside changeup right there, which Glavin kind of made famous. The quick learner and the YouTube videos of players that have once played are so popular amongst these teams now. 
Jackson Appel sends one to right. That's a one out hit for him. I, I think it's key. This part of the order has to go today for AM if they're going to come back and have a chance to win this game. And it's it's the older guys, it's the experienced guys. Appel, Shot, Burton. All of them transfers. Two from the Ivy Leagues, Burton from Michigan. Appel gets it started right there with a one out single. And none of them have homered here in Omaha. And that, that, that might be it. Now, by Tello made it clear in his interview with Budden, it's not going to be too long that we're going to hang here. So the hit from Appel with one out. That's Vitella talking with Frank Anderson. Sneed is ready in the bullpen. And he will throw a couple more pitches before Vitello likely makes his way out. Took a few steps down. I'm not sure that's happening right here. Well, I mean, left on left here, it would it would make sense that they stick with Seacrest. Keep an eye on Appel. He is their most prolific base dealer. This one is in the hole, and it's going to get through. Appel takes a turn, puts the brakes on, and a seeing eye single from Hayden shot. And just like that, two aboard for the Aggies with one down. Well, there you go, KP. Back to ba back to back base hits from the transfers that have meant so much to this team. This one not exactly smoked, but a seeing eye single finds its way through. The Aggies now in a position with one swing of the bat, they could take the lead. And Tony Vitello going to go to the right hander. Well, Seacrest is going to come out of the game, and after having struck out four in a row and retiring six straight, back-to-back -back singles, and a big hand, he will receive as he heads back. Sneed coming in. We'll see if Seacrest finds a seat next to the men's room to get this offense going again. It is 3-1 Tennessee. A&M threatening here in the six with two on. Xander Sechrist outstanding in his performance for the Vols. They are 5-0 in his last five games started. They are in the lead right now. And they go from a lefty that throws 72-73 to a righty who can hump it up there between 96 and 100. Little different look right here. Mr. Sneed coming out of the bullpen. This is the fifth time that Nate Sneed has pitched in this College World Series. Did pitch yesterday, winning inning, 15 pitches. It was a perfect Final inning the Nate Sneed threw yesterday 10 to 2 with a 305 but the biggest thing is the velocity. And for Xander Seacrest just doing what he's done the, the, pretty much the entire season for this Tennessee team and he has given him a chance again one walk seven strikeouts worked into the sixth. Now it's a bullpen game for the balls. There are two men on as he takes the baseball. Appel is at second base, shot is at first. He talks to his middle infielders. If they get a ground ball, they'd love to turn to and walk out of here. Ted Burton is the guy up. KP said this is the part of the order that's going to have to deliver for the Aggies. Great nice block pass. and no advancement down there at second. Appel thought about it, but give Cal Stark a whole bunch yes. of credit. That is what he is really good at. The catch component of, of that position, man, if this gets away at all, because it was an aggressive secondary by Appel out at second base, it just got his leg off the glove, got his leg, but stayed close enough that nobody could move up. Steed's allowed nine home runs. One ball, one strike. Nope, Dwight. Behind now two and one. That's a big pitch. All pitching coaches emphasize that one one pitch. You get ahead one two or go behind. Big pitch and then at bat. Off speed pitch and a real good one. A little slider that got away from him. It's two balls, two strikes.
On the ground, could be two. Curly, slow on the flip, and they only wow. get one. He couldn't get out of his glove, so they get the force at second, but they don't get out of the inning. I tell you, that, that goes from being like a sure 6-4-3 to it was almost a disaster. Yeah. This ball comes out of Curly's glove, and he ends up flipping it on the second try with his hand. Look at that. He basically pats it with his hand right to Simo on a ball that, you know, Burton runs well, but I, that's, I think, a no-doubt 6-4-3, and it almost ended up bases loaded with one out. Pretty quick thinking on his feet to Ooh. tap it over there. That's one you don't practice very often. No. No. <laughs> the mid-air handball flip to second. <laughs> Technical turn. What a chance for Caden Sorrell. He'll get Sneed. Runners at first and third. One ball, no strikes. He hasn't thrown a just a straight fastball yet. We've seen a fair amount of cutters since he's come in. That was another cutter right there that just missed out. Pretty good speed out there at first base. Burton has stolen 10 bases. Good speed at third base. The one order Sorrell. Swing and a miss. They'll throw behind oh, wow. him. Just oh. about did it again. They will look to see if they got him. We saw this yesterday where Burke looked into his dugout and said, I got him. They checked it, and he was right. Uh, here it is again, and he's up the line, so the tag always ends up arriving before you think it does. It looks like the hand beats the tag live, but does it? Well, I think it did. I don't think he got him on his backside. It, if he didn't get him on his backside and the, and the glove doesn't arrive till the shoulder, I think it is if he got him on the upper leg or lower back area. But, <laughs> but what did Blake Burke tell us again before yeah, the game? Not real good at it. <laughs> It's a little no emotional. challenge thing sometimes. Sometimes I'm not so good at. He is really good at that play, though. They both are. Yeah, Stark and Burke are absolutely on the same page. They can go. Uh, they can read each other very well. They got a signal there. After review, the safe call at first base is confirmed. Tennessee is charged with its first challenge of the game and has one remaining. Well, that one was certainly worth the challenge, right? You're running off the field yeah, of in, a, in a big time traffic situation. If that one goes your way, it's like Mike Early wants to have a little meeting here with his freshman. Well, offensive timeout here by the Aggies just to kind of go back over the game plan. Well, that swing through on that last pitch was the first true fastball that he has thrown, and that one had some life. 97 that was right by Sorrell. Huge spot in this game, down two. With two down, they bring Sneed in. Appel bounces off third, here it comes. That's in the dirt, Stark did block it, and Burton stays put at first. Trying to win their first. Championship in any sport since Team Martin hit peerless price. The same accuracy that Stark finds Burke down there at first. Here's the 2 1 on the way to Sorrell. And he pulls it right at Burke and he snared it. The hot corner goes from third to first, and Burke, even with the bag, makes the play. Wow, are you kidding me? The freshman and a rocket shot. Right at Black Blake Burke. That almost looked like self-defense, but the balls get off the field. In student athlete scholarships from Capital One, the men's side Notre Dame. KP by a point from Longhorns ahead of Stanford. Big news in college baseball, by the way. Texas gonna be looking for a new men's head baseball coach. They move to the SEC. Evan Oshenbeck now on for Texas A&M. The senior out of Brenham, Texas, has been nothing short of phenomenal, and the numbers speak for themselves. Incredible, incredible year. He 
Yeah, it's an incredible arsenal, too. I mean, for Aschenbeck, the fastball is going to be right around 90, maybe a little bit more, but it's fastball slider change up at any count, at any time to righties or lefties. There, there is no pattern, which is why he's been so good. Just 12 walks in the entire season for the guy that has been the best closer in the country. He shut down Tennessee for seven Ks. He got eight outs. And here he is. So you wonder, like, as we go big hat here, if you wonder, does the advantage at all go back to the Vols who've seen him, like, a couple days ago? Well, I, I think you'd rather have seen him than not seen him, right? I mean, I, I think that that's helpful. But Evan Oshabak's had plenty of opportunities to face teams multiple times and been highly successful. It hasn't mattered. Yes. All right, so Tears, Curley, and Peebles, bottom of the six. Whoever wins this will claim the College World Series championship. Three defenders on the right side as Tears swings and misses again. And the thing about Oshenbeck, too, Chris, is you've got to be aggressive because he doesn't throw a lot of That's balls. That's right. Yeah, you got to go up there ready to hit. I would almost go up in, in more of a two strike mentality. Featured lineup, ESPN Networks, the last weekend in June. You got the NBA draft, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, Wednesday, ABC and ESPN. UFC 303, 9 Eastern, that's pay-per-view. And the WNBA, it's the Fever, and the Phoenix Sunday at 3 Eastern Time on ESPN. That is Caitlin Clark's team, 3 o'clock Eastern Time, as we look at our featured lineup on the networks for the last weekend in June. Summer is here. Here's Curley, one for two with a single. And a tap pass for a force out at second base. You know, KP said it. It's it's any pitch and any count, and they're all for strikes. So you really can't go up there and hunt anything because it's it's so unpredictable, and they're really good at changing up their sequences. But you, you can't be too aggressive, that's for sure. Yeah, you got to get it before it melts, and it's, it's a liquid. <laughs> Night like tonight, you, you're working fast there. 93 degrees currently in Omaha, and there's no sun on the field anymore on a 1-1 that misses away. Still in the stands, though. It is in the stands. Two and two. Got to be some deception there. Max Wiener, the pitching coach, just calls him a well-oiled machine, and he said, and he was a coach with the Mariners, who have one of the best pitching staffs in the country. He said he's a well-oiled machine, the likes of which I'd never seen before. Well, I mean, it, this is a pitching coach's dream. When, when you, if you're calling pitches and you got a guy out there that, honestly, count does not dictate what he throws. I mean, the only thing that dictates what he throws is what you think the scouting report is because he's comfortable throwing any three at any spot. Two two curly that's way outside three and two the okay. curly just climb on to the two strikes I mean his toes are on the chalk. I think you have to challenge Josh and Beck to go inside I, I, I really do. Right field towards the line. LaViolette giving it a run. He dives. It's off his glove. Curly to second. That's going to be a double. On a diving effort from LaViolette, but Curly is on his second hit of the night. And the freshman just continues to impress. This ball, I think LaViolette thought this ball was going to carry a little further than it did. And by the time it got to him, it was really just kind of nose diving. Thought he needed to leave his feet to make the play and just can't quite finish the catch. The head bounces just a touch and he just can't quite secure it. Curly with now his second hit of the ball game as he continues an impressive showing here at the World Series. Oshenbeck has to buckle down now. He's got Peebles, the DH, the eighth hitter in the lineup. Bounces one and no advancement from Curley. Dean Curley has nine hits in Omaha. He's a freshman. 
Single and a double tonight to add to what has been an incredible run for him here. Aschenbeck was up yesterday in what was obviously a tight game late. They didn't go to him because if for some reason they couldn't hold the lead, he likely wouldn't be able to be used tonight. And they would put in jeopardy what their plan was. This is their plan. That one is again towards that foul line. La Violette and Burton going after it. La Violette makes a great running catch. Curly to third. And they will cut it off there. Really good play by Jace Laviolette. That's a few really goods right there. This is where the size of foul territory can really help you steal some outs. And, and that curved wall that goes down the right field line, the further that Laviolette goes, the more room that he has to make this play. That's heads up base runner by Dean Curley. Too. Mm -hmm. One out gets back, ready to tag, and Laviolette from right field has to basically make that throw on the run. No chance to get Curley, who's now 90 feet away. And the hero, one of them from yesterday, is at the Cal Stark. Behind 0 and 1. I'm telling you, fellas, and you know it. A couple of days ago, Lavi, let's not get into that baseball. No. Chance. We've seen him moving around just fine today. That was impressive there, too, how he stayed on his feet to finish that one off. Easy to get scared by that railing. 0 oh, and 1 to Stark, looking for some two out magic. Wait. Back and this crowd recognized it a strike away from stranding the runner at third base and avoiding the top of the volunteers batting order. Wait. It's a good take by Stark the catcher not to go fishing. They're trying to run that change up off the plate. I should be throwing it. The exact same spot twice in this at bat. Starks taking it both times. And a squibber to first. Burton will field it himself. Stark is out. Early stranded. Good job by Oshenbeck. Seventh coming up. Rated mature. The hospitality, handshakes, and smiles. The greatest sporting events are the ones where you can't imagine the event without the town or the town without the event. In Omaha, we can't imagine any of this without you. Thank you. Well said, Ryan McGee. Thank you, Ryan. Of course, to the people like Jack and Terry Deasing who do such a great job each and every year with this College World Series. Polly and Karen Griego, folks at Oak Hills and Happy Hollow and Shadow Ridge, Omaha Prime. Kyle Peterson for his hospitality as the mayor of this city. <laughs> They'll check first, and they say Camarillo went. Glad you all enjoy it. We love it. We kind of like this place. We know how spoiled we are to be here. And so do these people, man. They have flocked here to see, again, two SEC teams as they continue their dominance over this sport. The 0-2 to Camarillo didn't miss by much. Now you could feel, too, yesterday in the stadium, seventh inning, <laughs> one nothing, and all of a sudden it got a little quieter. Here we are at the top of the seventh, 3-1. Tennessee getting close to claiming their first ever championship. Camarillo will not chase. Yeah, it's easy to get to this part of the ball game and start counting outs. For Tennessee, they get a two-run lead. It, you, you know, you can start feeling like all we got to do is get nine outs. And for the Aggies, 
the weight of trying to produce some offense can start to fill up that dugout. The, the game is played so much where we always talk about go get them tomorrow, go get them tomorrow. Like when you finally play in a game where there isn't a tomorrow, 100%, you really feel it. And it's not only there's not a tomorrow to play, there's not a tomorrow where you're going to have all of these teammates and family members around you like this. That's a swing and a miss and a fist pump from Stark. He need to use that cutter a little bit more tonight. Fastball's 95, 96. The cutter will be right around 90, and you can see just that's grip and throw straight through the baseball. Plenty of velocity and enough movement to get it off of Camarillo's bat. Kent popped straight up, giving Chase both Amick and Stark, and there was no play, and they had a lot of help over there. Vitello, if Stark is sort of a mirror image of him, that means he's passionate and intense and loyal. This guy, man, he barks orders and they fall in line. And was he fired up early yesterday's game? <laughs> was he fired up? Yeah, I don't know what? that I've seen a, early. A, a warning on the third pitch of the game. Team ended up winning on the 0-1. Like like one and one. Can't hit that hard. That's a single right up the middle as he turned around a 95 mile an hour fastball. There's the Caden Kent we've been seeing this entire postseason. Something out and over the middle of the plate, and that is a rocket. And we got ourselves a pinch hitter here as Ryan Targach, who hit yesterday off Nate Sneed and made this thing very interesting with a deep fly out to right field. He's going to get another opportunity to hit off Snead. The significance of the number on his back and everyone that's got that jersey right there. One of the great traditions in college sports, the 12th man. Targotch took Snead to the track yesterday. And this is the time that Jim Schlossnagel says we're pulling it. Targots has got a little of the Kyle Schwarber body to him, mm -hmm. and he's got that same power. Well, Tennessee knows he's got a report on Targots, too. Fastball, he can turn around. He showed you that last night. I mean, he just missed hitting that ball out to tie it. First pitch from Sneed, a breaking ball, and he didn't see a breaking ball the entire bat yesterday. Good. Top of the zone goes one and one. He turned a fastball around yesterday, foul. That almost hit the blat out there in uh, right field, beyond the right field wall. Quick, quick bat. He's already had one remarkable moment in this season. Does he have another one? Not a true fastball yet, I don't think. That was a change up there that kind of drifted up and arm side. Targotch only one home run this year, but 28 in his career. And everyone on the first base side in Maroon is up. Three balls and a strike, and that's going to cause a meeting from Stark. KP, you said you had tears in your eyes after this. Cool moment. Really cool moment. It, it, it was ultimately a walk-off enter, but it was a 10-run game, so it's a little bit different walk-off. But for Targach, I mean, this guy was an all-SEC second baseman at one point. How many home runs in his career? 28, 29. Um, but the place went absolutely crazy. He came from coach in first base. Schloss yelled at him to run into the dugout and grab a bat. And, and you got to think at that point, if you're Targaj, you're thinking, I'm this done. may be the yep. last at bat. 100%. But he's been ready when they call his number, and they've done it back to back nights. Well, you can tell how Tennessee's respecting him, too. I mean, they have been very careful 
interestingly so more careful in this at bat than they were yesterday. It's a 3-1 count, usually a fastball count. And they walk Targots, and now you got two men on. They respected him in a big way. The leadoff man, Grahovac, is coming up. And he's got a chance to put him ahead. Interesting move right there by Schlossnagel here in the seventh to go to that bullet. It just played out perfectly for a &M. Sure did. And you get Caden Kenna on the nine holes Travis Chestnut. They're, they're going to pinch it for anyway in that situation. And it's the same matchup they got last night. Now a &M with two on. Turning the lineup over and the left-hander Dylan Loy up and working in that Tennessee bullpen. Yeah, and it's just it's quite obvious here with Snead that the fastball is not the same as it was yesterday. Yesterday we saw everything 97 to 99. The fastballs, so many of them. yeah, and the ones we've seen were 94. So I think part of that tells you that the fastballs just not quite got the life today. The fact that they're going to different parts of the arsenal. Man, did they pitch Ryan Targach very carefully there. Didn't even throw him a 3-1 heater. And now you turn it over to the two scariest dudes in this order. He wears number 12. He's at first base. Caden Kent with his single is at second. And the freshman, Grahovac. Looking for that big hit. 23 times he's left the building. Nope. He's trying to lean into one, and he held off. Grahovac all over that, and he pulled it foul. The uh, the pitch selection is very different today for Steve than it mm -hmm. usually is. I mean, he, he's usually well over 60% fastball usage. We've seen a lot of cutters. We saw a slider to start this at bat. Grahovac led off yesterday's game with a homer. It's getting loud here at Charles Schwab Field. Two and one. The left-handed hitting Laviolette is due up next, and that's one of the reasons they get a couple of lefties out there in that bullpen right now working for the balls. Swing and a miss. Good pitch. Two and two. Took something off of it and had some movement away. You can feel it here right now, both sides standing. Grahova hits this one to right. Tears is there. Kent at second, tags, heads to third. Strong throw is just offline. And that's a huge out, and now maybe, maybe the most critical at bat of this game. Well, left on left, do, do you go down to the bullpen right now? Well, something to think about. Lobby led 353 with 13 homers versus left-handers this year. So, you know. The, the splits are reversed. The splits are reversed from a batting average standpoint. He does have more homers against right-handers. He also has a bunch more at bats. I mean, you're talking about 13 homers and 83 at bats. Tello had his clipboard out. He looked at some numbers. It looks like we're going to leave Sneed in to face LaViolette. What a matchup. Nope. Ball one. What do you think? Leave him in. You like it because of the reverse splits? Yeah, I think this is your guy. I, I think Nate Sneed been the guy. Him and Kirby Connell have been the guys at the back end of the games all year long. The game's on the line. It's a big spot to bring a freshman Dylan Roy into. LaViolette high chopper. That's Moore, who's at first, Burke. He got the foot down. What a play. It bounced over Burke's head. Moore was there, and Burke does some fancy footwork to end the inning. Tell you what, early in the day. I want to be remembered as a legend, remembered as, you know, a great teammate, a good person, a guy that gave his all for Tennessee each and every day, and it was never a question about it. If I can have those three things passed down, I, 
I did my job here at Tennessee. Guys, when Simo and I talked on Friday, he said, I have thought about winning a national championship almost every day for the last three years. The 2022 team couldn't get here as the number one seed. He goes back to last year in Omaha, replays all of the at-bats in his head and said, this is the year. I got to remind myself when I'm at the plate, slow down. But he said, I can visualize the national championship. Well, he certainly helped get him to this spot, and he's helped already with one homer. He golfs this one to right. That's where Caden Sorrell has moved, and he is under it to make the play. Get you those defensive changes for Schlossnagel. In the outfield, Grahovac is now in left. LaViolette is in center. Sorrell is in right. Targotch is now at second base. Caden Kent has moved to third base. And Aschenbeck continues to get outs. More Brooklyn kid. He was in a couple of different high schools, ended up at Suffield Academy in Connecticut. They were on him because of his older brother. Really enjoyed that experience as this one is smoked to left center field. Off the bat of Burke, LaViolette's calling it, and they nearly collided with each other. And again, the change of Grohovac into left field, LaViolette to center. They haven't been communicating with each other all game, but it is caught by Grohovac. Yeah, I don't know that LaViolette trusted his buddy that's been playing third base all year. He's thinking, let me just go ahead and finish this one off, big fella. But fortunately for the Aggies, Grohovac stays camped and keeps his concentration, which is not easy to do with 6'6 bearing down on you. So we've had two pitches and two quick outs. Man, this guy would love to get on track. Billy Amick is 0 for 3 tonight. Oh. Oshenbeck's first pitch is down. Stage reaction after that play, which LaViolette bounced it over Burke's head and Moore was over there, was fairly incredible. He knew that was a huge part of this lineup and this game. had one heck of a ball game two for four is two outs are both balls that are basically going to hit the, the base of the wall yep. the defensive plays the base running play I mean, he has really yep. impacted this game Wait. Beck falls behind three and one to Amick who's been so good all year and a comfortable hitting count with Dryling on deck He smokes one in the left. That was up, and that's the pitch Amick was waiting for. He will take a big turn. And a two-out hit for Billy Amick. Reminder, first round this year's NHL draft. That's Friday, 7 Eastern, ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. The Sharks go first, then the Blackhawks. The NHL draft, we're going to be at the Sphere. That's in Las Vegas, Friday, 7 Eastern time, ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. Tennessee hockey sweater. I don't see that very often. <laughs> no. This is uh, maybe not the night that you want to wear a hockey sweater. Pretty bold. We had a Tennessee Augusta shirt yesterday. Golf shirt. Anything orange. Swing and a miss there and a big one from Dryling. This guy has been so clutch all year long, really. And then it's only ticked up here in the postseason. That ball is lifted deep to right. LaViolette is at the track. Check that. It's not LaViolette. It's Sorrell. And it is gone. A huge two-run home run. And that is a big, big shot for clutch man Dylan Dryling.
just over the leap of Sorrell. I don't think if LaViolette was there, he'd have a chance. How about Dylan Dryling? A two-run shot to make it 5-1, and he is homered in all three yeah. of the World Series games. That just might be your most outstanding player in the College World Series right there. Dylan Dryling has put on a show. Got a slider, backspun it just enough to run it out. Change this game, man. 3-1, I think, offensively for AM. You're you're a bloop and a blast away. Now you got to put a lot more together right now. And for Aschenbeck, that doesn't happen very often. No, and I tell you, the Amick at bat, Amick had struggled so bad he got that 3-1 pitch, got the single on the ground past the dive of Kent. And the volunteers here in the bottom of the seventh are feeling real good right now. Well, you said it right, the Amick got a mistake. And with two outs and nobody on, he hits a line drive to left center, and then Dylan Dryan looked like a changeup, KP, a change -up. and he kind of yeah. cuts it. The wind has really softened. He misses it just a touch, but he launches it into the air, and this ball just never came down. Sorrell tracks it and tracks it, and he just runs out of real estate, did everything he could to bring that ball to clutch hit really all year long, but certainly here in Omaha. He's been great, and that is a home run in all of these finals games. And they had just moved LaViolette, who robbed a home run earlier in this World Series, to center field. He's got a handful of inches on Sorrell. Just never know. You never know. I just can't believe how that ball stayed in the air, because there isn't much wind, but what wind there is is kind of coming in from right center. And that ball just, just kept carrying. It, it did not cross my mind when the ball came off the bat that it, was that it had a chance to uh -huh. leave. I mean, it just looked like fly ball to right, 3-1 game. Here come the Aggies, and Dryland had a little bit different plan. How good has he been all season? After a meeting with Wiener, 5-1 game, tears, ball one. And for Tennessee to get to the invincible Oshenbeck is a big, big story tonight. is ripped to right center. This time LaViolette is there and it goes off the wall. Bare hands fires it in. Rounding and coming home. We got to play at the plate. What a relay. Safe what at the plate. They missed the tag. Six one Tennessee. What an avoiding of the tag. Hunter Ensley. What a read to go inside the tag of Appel. This ball smashed, KP. I mean, that's a ball 111 feet, 400, 111 miles an hour, 408 feet. Lobby left, bare hands it, and throws a strike to Camarillo, who finishes it off. And Hunter Ensley just pulls a Houdini act. Like, how did he miss Appel? And I think he's <laughs> safe, y'all. Goes back and tags him after. Generally, yes. that's an indicator yes, that he point. doesn't think uh -huh. he got him on the way by to start. You can put that whole play on an instructional video. Yes. Because the way that Lavalette played it in center field, the way that the relay gave him a chance, and then out of nowhere. Wow. He's safe. Yeah, he, he said it as much. You can lip read on the bench. I'm safe. What a slide. And don't forget, Hunter Inslee did not play in the field in game one of this because of a hamstring. Yeah. And here he is going first to third, I mean, first to home to score the sixth run of the ball game on just an incredible effort. It took two perfect throws to have a chance. And then it, it took an absolutely perfect slide. Didn't Lobby let barehanded off the he wall? He did. One hop off the wall in the spot where the wall is not an easy place to play it. And this is his first inning in center field today. Yep. I mean, that was top level all the way around. At, at first, you think it's leaving the ballpark. 408 feet. That, that's, that's usually a home run pretty much anywhere. Next thing you know, it looks like the Aggies are off the field. Hunter Inslee just had other ideas. Josh Elander with the send. It was a pretty wise send, and what a slide. You're going to remember that forever. High school football players made a few people miss in his day. That's one he will never forget right there. Waiting on the review of the call of safe at home. 
After review, the call of safe is confirmed. <laughs> All of this in this inning, two outs, nobody on. That's when it started. The Amick single, the Dryland home run, the Ensley single, and then the Kavaras tears takes one off the right center field wall that have two outs, nobody on. Then this game changed in a hurry. And all against the guy who'd given up one run and Evan Oshenbeck. 6 1 volunteers, and now you can start to count the outs to a championship. A five run lead for Rocky Top. Curly elevates to center. LaViolette is there, but how about three runs in the bottom of the seventh? A dryling two run shot and a Houdini act by Hunter Ensley. The Vols are inching closer to their first been a bit 1951 they were the World Series runner-up as we welcome you back to the NCAA Men's College World Series presented by Capital One what's in your wallet well two strike and two out hits a big big part of this best of three College World Series final and they played three to now lead by five as we entered the eighth inning Sneed stays in the game and the first pitch to Appel is in there for a strike If Tennessee wins, it'll get them 60 and a national championship. That'd be the first time that happened since Wichita State in 1989. Okay. Middle of the order for A&M, and they need a lot of runners. That's in there for a strike. Right back up the middle, a very good start for a team that needs five to tie. Here in the eighth, the leadoff hit for Appel. That's his second hit of the night. Talked about it earlier. It feels like this is the part of the lineup yep. that if AM's going to have a chance to come back, it's it's got to happen right now. Appel shot Burton right in the middle of this lineup. And Appel gets it started with a leadoff single right there. You got to get a couple here if you're the Aggies. You, you got to get to within striking distance in the ninth. Still bullpen activity for the Vols. We saw Dylan Loy up last half inning. He is back up again as they meet on the mound after the leadoff hit from Appel. Say this too about the home run that Dryling hit. A, it was up in the air forever, and the wind is still blowing in, and it still was able to get over that wall. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure out how Tears' ball stayed in the park. And Dryling's and ball how left, left. left. Yeah, I mean, you just never know here. They're going to make the move to wow. Loy Sneed. He did his job when he was able to get Laviolette out on that bounding ball over the first baseman said to end the last inning. So Loy is coming in. Runner at first and AM down five. Discover customer service. This is Maya. Oh, hi, Maya. You robots are sounding more human every day. At Discover, everyone can talk to a human representative. All right, prove it. Wait, are you a robot? 24 7 U.S. based customer service. How would I prove that I'm not? Oh my god. And the smile on that kid's face. He's got 11 RBIs in this World Series. That is tied for the most by a Tennessee player in a single men's college World Series. Big hit after big hit for Dylan Dryling. Florida State. And just a little insurance that was necessary. Now the freshman Dylan Loy gets it. What a spot for a freshman to commit. Yeah. There's nobody out. It's a 6 1 game, but most important, you got a chance for a championship. Yeah, I'd say Dylan Loy's had a really good year. Um, 
but he doesn't have a save. 20 appearances, five starts, had a good start in the SEC tournament. Doesn't give up a lot of hits. It's primarily sinker slider. But this is different than any situation he's ever come yeah. in right here. A veteran hitter here and Hayden shot. How big will those three runs be when this is all said and done? Good start to throw a strike at 87 miles an hour. That one gets through and that's going to allow a Pell with all his speed now to head down to second base. Cal Stark just didn't get the glove down there. See the frustration in him. This is a ball that Cal Stark catches 99 out of 100 times and the glove just a little high. The ball scoots through. The runner moves into scoring position again. The Aggies just need a couple. Give yourself a puncher's chance in the ninth. The cleanup hitter in the batting order shot. Two hits tonight, eight in this series, and he got a pitch to hit there, but he fouled it straight back. Give this pitching staff for Tennessee credit. The first nine tournament games, A&M was averaging almost eight runs a game. They got one yesterday, and they have one tonight. Nagel talked about all his contemporaries who've come here, won a championship. They implied it doesn't really change you, and he politely said, well, I wouldn't mind winning one just to find out. I'll take one of my own, though. One, two. Way inside. That one gets to the backstop, and a couple of wild pitches now have moved Appel up to third base. They did call the first one that got through Stark a wild pitch, so that's number two here. That gets some people up and moving around in the bullpen. You got to believe Kirby Connell is is somewhere in the mix for a last appearance of his career. It would be impossible to understand what goes through an individual when they come into a situation like that. But to the point that's been made all night long, when you're in the last game of the season for a championship, it's going to be different. There is Canell out there. And you mentioned Roy hadn't gotten a save, so just to end the game hasn't happened very often to him. Obviously, five runs isn't that. But a 2-2 with nobody out, pitch on the way. And shot sends this one to left. Dryling in the corner, still drifting, now takes off, and so did the ball. He had no chance as it ends up in the seats. Further evidence of just how incredible it was that his ball went over it. the wall. Yeah, because yeah, no wind blowing, that's an out. It was just enough late to blow it into the stands. I mean, at one point, he looked comfortably under this baseball, and then it. it wasn't even close to being in play. Shot trying to bring Appel in from third base. And he will do it up the middle. He delivers another hit. And there is a run for the Aggies. Aiden shot three hits tonight. It's 6-2 and nobody out. Oh, 
Well, that does get him scrambling that Tennessee bullpen. Now Kirby Connell is throwing, getting ready as quick as he can. Back to back singles and a couple of wild pitches in this inning. And Hayden shot with a night. Single in the second, single in the sixth. Now the RBI single here in the eighth brings the Aggies back within four. First baseman Ted Burton. In there for strike one. Nine homers, a 286 average on the season for Burton. Cannell and Combs, who was so good yesterday. The righty warming up as well. On a play, and he is ahead 0 and 2. Mattello made mention of it yesterday, too. We're in the eighth, but he said, I'd prefer to be the home team and have a chance in the bottom because the ninth inning is drama no matter what the score is. The son of a longtime coach, Vitello knew he wanted to do this from the time he was real young. Be a head coach. There is his dad. Swing and a miss. That's a big punch out from Dylan Loy. Best slider he has thrown since he came in this game. That was thrown with authority. And you get ahead in that 0-2 count. It makes you feel a little bit better when you're out there. And the freshman kind of, I think, needed this right here for his confidence. Ted Burton all the way out in front. And exactly where you want to throw that pitch, 0-2. Make it look like a strike. Dive under the, the bat and right at the back foot of Ted Burton. Aiden Sorrell's hit it over the wall 11 times this year. And he gets ahead 0-1. And, and, and yeah, we'll see, Kyle. That may have been the big pitch to kind of free him up a little bit. You got to believe that heartbeat's pumping Ooh. pretty fast right now. Uh, Five-run lead or not, you run out here with only six outs to go in the championship game. You, you, you're pumping a little bit, no doubt about it. This one is in the left. That's going to get down. That's going to send Dryling towards the wall where it goes against the wall. Shots being waved in. Here's the throw home. It's not close. And a double and an RBI. It's now 6 3. Caden Sorrell. Now here come the Aggies. We talked about it just a couple. Just give yourself a chance in the ninth. Boy, had the at bats been really good. Appel with a rocket shot with a bullet back up the middle, and now Sorrell stays on one. We've been talking about this freshman and how bright his future is. An absolute rocket in the backside gap. Credit Hayden shot for the tenacity to go first to home on a bum knee, and the Aggies have made this one very interesting. Here comes Tony Vitello. There won't be another for Lloyd. This inning started 6-1. They got two of the three they gave up back. Ali Camarillo is set to hit for the Aggies. Signals for the lefty. Canel fires one more warm up pitch and he will enter from the bullpen and take center stage. He'll inherit a one out one on situation with his team. Five outs away. Five outs away from a championship. Kirby Canell comes into the game for the balls. For years they competed against each other. But every four years, Dur from the bullpen and takes center stage. He'll inherit a one out, one on situation with his team. Five outs away. Five outs away from a championship. Kirby Cannell comes into the game for the balls. 
college sports fans. Hey, with officially licensed merchandise from the NCAA official online shop, NCAA.com slash shop. Get the whole family geared up with the best. The NCAA Men's College World Series is presented by Capital One. Monday night in Omaha, the wheels are spinning on both sides. A 6-3 ball game in favor of Tennessee. Aiden shot just delivered three singles an RBI in a run dryling has been the hero he had the homer a double three RBI Secrets was tremendous as a starter a couple of things have gone on Kirby Cannell is in he has appeared in all of the World Series games and they have taken Dean Curley out at shortstop and replaced him with Angel Antiqua. Ariel that I say Angel Ariel Antigua. He came into the game yesterday and played second base. And Ariel now takes over for Curly. We'll try to see if there was an injury or what would cause them to take Curly out of the game. Well, if you're Tennessee, I, th I think the guy on the mound is the one that you trust the most in any situation. It may not be the most off the chart stuff, but nobody has appeared in a baseball game on the mound in the history of Tennessee baseball more than Kirby Connell. Comes in at a big spot here and faces Camarillo to start. Always the shortstop. Cannell is the Iron Man for the Vols. And that first pitch, he pours it in there for a strike. Missed with a breaking pitch. Cannell in five and a third here in Omaha has given up seven hits. But just just the one earned run, but he has given up a bunch of base hits. One more base hit here would, would make this thing really interesting. One one to Camarillo. Missed outside. Two balls and a strike. The temperature and this field is rising quickly. Connell ready. That's outside. Three balls and a strike. Caden Kent, who's had a monster series, is on deck. Gets it at the letters. Big pitch to go 3 2. Listening into the pitch com to get the pitch call. Camarillo pulls it foul. As impressive as he's been on the field, Cannell is as popular a guy as this team has. He is wildly popular in the community as well. He gives his time to the fans that ask, and he's certainly given everything he has to this team. That one is in the hole. Antigua's got it. He will fire. Safe at first base, a diving effort by Camarillo and a terrific effort by Ariel Antigua in the hole. The fact that they even had a chance to make this play. I mean, Antigua does it as well as you possibly can, and just enough speed from Camarillo. All right, shortstop, bring this down. Well, the pop-up slide gives you the best chance to get to your feet and get something on it. And I just marvel at the range of this young shortstop. Not your traditional shortstop body type, but can't. Man, can he move his feet and the arm strength to almost finish it off. Camarillo laying is really a missed opportunity by Sorrell to not be on third base there with one out. But you want to know why Antigua was in the game for Curly. It's plays like that right yeah. there. Here comes Caden Kent. He is the tying run here in the top of the eighth inning. Swings at the first one off speed. His father, longtime MLB player Jeff Kent, has come out of his seat 
And everyone is either up or on the edge of theirs. He singled up the middle his last time up. And that's another good breaking pitch, and he is in an 0-2 hole. Back-to-back -back sliders right there, and you got to think that Connell's just going to expand off, maybe bring it a little closer, a little bit closer, but I'd be surprised at this point if he sees anything other than a breaking ball. 0-2. He chased. What a job by Connell. As he moved further and further away from the plate, and a huge second out but here we go again with Ryan Targoch. I mean that's pitching one on one right there three straight break of balls and when you get ahead expand the zone if he doesn't swing bring it in a little bit further doesn't have to right there O2 slider gets Caden Ken swing and then now the Aggies will go back to the bench for a pinch hitter. Oh, Targoch. Targoch. Targoch is still yeah. in there all yeah. right. Wouldn't this be something. Stayed in to play second base. So loud, it's hard to hear that pitch calm. Targotch ready, not here. The 12th man for the Aggies, wearing the most important number. Strike one, a slider at the knees. pitches from Kirby Cannell. One thing he's always been able to do is spin that breaking ball. There's a reason they trust him. Not afraid to put the ball in the strike zone with a whole bunch of different pitches in spots like this. He is ready. 0-2. Way outside. Look at the job that Stark is doing to navigate Connell through this inning. One and two. Slider got him swinging and look at the reaction from Kirby Connell on the Volunteers bench. That's why you bring him in. You trust that slot. After the drama there in the top of the eighth in Omaha, hi, I'm Scott Van Pelt getting set for Sports Center. We're going to have full highlights and more reaction from this game. The key moments in postgame coverage, Game 7, Stanley Cup Final. Florida's got a 2-1 lead there. We're going to hear from J.J. Redick about the challenges as he takes over as the head man of the Los Angeles Lakers. That and more on the way. Now back to Omaha. Carl Ravage. Ravi. All right, SVP, good Game 7, great Game 3 here as Aschenbeck. Trying to keep it at 6-3. Slow day in sports, huh? Yeah. Game three here, game seven, Stanley Cup Finals, and J.J. Reddick gets a head job. Oh, and two out of play. It goes off the bat of Peebles. 6-3 ball game. How about Kirby Connell getting that job done with that slider? Clutch pitches. I mean, that's that's what he's known for. That's what he delivered. But the Aggies did get themselves a chance. And not just the not just the two runs, but to get yourself back to the top of the yes. order, right? You're right back to the most dangerous part of the order. And if you're in that Tennessee dugout right now, you would love a couple more. It's a good point too you made about maybe Antigua going in for defensive reasons. Curley had had the last at bat. He was the last guy up, mm -hmm. flew out to center. So we start with Peebles behind him. And Antigua nearly had one of the great web gems of this game. Yeah, there just not a ton of swing and miss in that Tennessee bullpen. Granted, yep. Connell just did get a couple strikeouts there. And like you said, Kurt, Curley's probably had his last at bat. At this point, you just, whatever you think your best nine defenders are, you got to have them out there. That's in there for a strike, one ball, one strike. Yeah. 
That ball is laced into the left field corner. It is cut off there. Stark heads for second as the ball was bobbled, and he's diving in. What an effort for Stark. They know they may need another, and he is in there with a double. Tennessee has hit more balls hard off of Oshenbeck in the last two innings than, than maybe anybody has in the last month. And here it is again right here. Remember, two outs, nobody on in that last inning. And they get four straight hits to score three runs. Now Cal Stark comes up to the plate. Base is empty. Grohovac, who started this game, played most of it at third base. Can't feel it right there. Stark's on there with a one-out double, and that turns this Tennessee lineup over. They'll give Grohovac an error, so single E7 as he didn't field it cleanly. And here we go with Christian Moore. Big swing from Simo, and you can hear his name being chanted by Vols fans, who most are standing now. the end of the bat Moore led this game off with a homer he has since struck out and popped out to right but he is the straw that stirs it all for this team offensively and then you have guys like Burke who fitted hard Dryling who left the building Oshenbeck is set on an 0-2 well he we talked about them needing insurance runs, right? What better opportunity right here? Runner in scoring position for Moore and Burke as you try to stretch this thing to four, which is three outs to go on defense. Good idea. Back to back change ups, try to come back, elevate the fastball. There's probably room in, but if you go in with a fastball, you just better not miss over the plate. 6'1, 216 pounds is more. Swing and a miss. He chased up. Nice job by Oshenbeck to pick up the punch out. The 78th annual NBA draft, now a two day event. First round, you can see it Wednesday at 8 on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN Deportes. His second round is Thursday at 4 Eastern time on ESPN. Atlanta Hawks have the first pick. Who are they going to take on Wednesday? That's 8 Eastern, ABC, ESPN, ESPN Deportes. Scott Van Pelt will probably have more on that on Sports Center, which follows our game as well as post game coverage. And you can get more post game coverage of this game over on the SEC network as well. 6-3. Blake Burke, who has looked as comfortable as anybody at the plate and hit it hard four times, swings and misses at the first one. I would be very careful right here. Amick actually does better against righties than lefties. I know he got a base hit last time, but Blake Burke has been dialed in all game long. Not there. They'll throw behind the runner. They get him out a run down. Stark to third, and he is tagged out. Yeah. Heads up play there by Appel to throw behind Cal Stark. Connell is ready, so is everyone else. Ninth inning coming up. AM needs three for championship. And kind of blow up this idea that as a one seed, you can't win this thing. It hasn't been done in a long time. The team from South Florida, Miami, did it in 1999. That was the first year of the national seeds. This year, seven of the eight teams that showed up were national seeds. The only one that wasn't was Florida. So Combs will come in now, and he picked up the first win yesterday in relief. He was outstanding. He's going to be charged with trying to get the final three out. Yeah, and, and he got 12 outs yesterday. Four innings, gave up three hits, did not give up any runs, but threw 63 pitches. Now on to try to finish this out and give Tennessee a national title. First pitch fastball above the letters to Gavin Grohovac. AM has the top of the order up. Yep. Combs himself out of Inspiration Academy, the IMG Academy in Florida. On a 1-0. He's ready. That's a good pitch. 94 miles an hour. 
pretty good sign after 63 pitches the day before to come back and go 94 94. Yeah, when your average fastball velo this year is about 92. So it, it's it's a tick or two up from where it usually is. A&M down by three. They got two in the eighth. That one was hung up there, and that's going to be good for a hit for a Hovac. He will take second. Here comes the throw. He dives in and a leadoff double. Gavin Grahovac. It will not be easy in the ninth inning. He kind of had a feeling he'd go to the breaking ball. Three straight heaters to start this sequence. A breaking ball that just stays up enough for Grahovac to get out over the plate and hook it down the left field line. You love the aggressiveness, even though you're down three. Take bases that you know you can get. And the Aggies offense seems to have come to life here the last couple innings. And their most prolific power hitter, Jace Lobulette. Double barrel action down there. Banky the lefty, Marcus Phillips the righty. In there, strike one. Laviolette thought that was a little bit high. He's got 50 career home runs, second most. He had a home run Sunday, which ended an 11-game homerless streak. 1-1. He gets the call, a two-seamer inside and up. Well, it's such a different look from that arm angle. Is that fastball that stays at the top of the zone, you're just not used to seeing it. It's exactly where Combs is trying to throw that pitch. Like the timeout right here. Calm your yep. slugger's heartbeat down. He's frustrated that call didn't go his way. Slow him down. Give him some some positive input. And remind him how great he is. He can hit behind an account. Now the two seamers been his pitch. He hung a slider and Grahovac ended up with a double. Hensley fairly shallow in center. Here it comes, and that misses away. Plenty of room in that right center field gap. Connell worked out of a jam in the eighth. And now Combs trying to do the same, but first Stark will have a word with him. Uh, to me, this is all about what you feel more is comfortable with. And with Lavulette's path and the way he likes to loft the ball, I think you stay at the top yes. of the zone with that fastball. I would not mess around with the off-speed stuff right here. No. He's already shown you during this at bat that he doesn't want it up there. I mean, he's taken two for a strike and one just out of the zone. And, and I think that's best path of success here. But you just got to make sure it's up in the <laughs> zone. If that comes down, Might have problems. that could be a different story. Two balls, two strikes. They did stay upstairs at 92. Count goes full. If he is aboard, Appel would be the tying run. He got him to chase. La Violette is gone. And that's a huge out for Combs. May have chased ball four. Yeah, and I just I like the approach when you get to that point. You had already seen in the at bat that Laviolette doesn't really want it there. If there's a hole in that swing, it's the elevated fastball that stays right there. And Combs goes back to back when he gets to 2-2. Two -two. Fastball just up and out of the zone. That would have been ball four, but Laviolette couldn't hold off. One down.
Holmes pumps in another fastball. To the backstop it goes, and that is another wild pitch. That's the third for the Vols in the last couple of innings. It was interesting, and, and a spot where if you're Combs, you don't really have to pay attention to Groho back on second base. When he lifted his leg right there, he turned all the way around, looked at second. Watch this. That head moves as that leg is coming up. You can see Groho back going back to second base. This is one where the guy on third base doesn't make any difference. Just get the guy standing at home plate if you're Aaron Combs. Appel's got two hits tonight. The guy behind him shot has three hits tonight. That is a great location in on the fists. I keep thinking about how big is that six run that Hunter Inslee scored in this game. Yeah. The Houdini act he pulled at home plate is the reason the tying run is not at the plate right now. Stark just signaled out to Moore to move over a few feet to his right at second base. Shirt Jr. on a Sarasota, Florida delivers. Breaking pitch left field. It's going to get down. He hung another one up there. Appel delivered his third hit. It's a two run ball game. The tying run is coming to the plate. Boy, that's two breaking balls for the both base hits this inning. And has Jackson Appel been clutch in this ball game? The veterans for the Aggies have shown up. Another RBI knock. And the Aggies are hanging around here. Now they got a puncher's chance, like we talked about here with the tying run up to play. This is Hayden shot. Three singles tonight. Swings at the first one. That was a thigh high fastball, and he sent it back to the seats. Tying run here in the ninth inning for AM. Good pitch right at the top of that zone. Shot does not run well. He's been banged up a little bit. Antigua is it short, Moore is it second. Round ball double play will give them the championship. late on that that's a strikeout they're one out away that fastball's got a little different gear to it tonight that thing is exploding in the top of the zone and if you're Ted Burton here that's the one you got to be looking for and I think if you're Combs there's no reason to throw anything else both hits in the inning on the breaking ball both strikeouts on the fastball Tennessee Volunteers are an out away from the school's first championship in baseball. Strike one as they allow Appel to head down to second. That's a ball. Yeah, it is. There's wow. nobody there, and he will go to third base. You know, it's not a bad idea to get some guys in there. Just make sure the mind is right. Well, they don't want to have the meeting. You can see Stark saying, nope, everybody back. Slow it down a little bit. Well, I'd say he looks pretty relaxed. Yeah, he said, I think he said, I didn't even know he went to second. <laughs> Swing and a miss, a strike away. That high heater has worked. And one more will be the key that opens the door to the championship.
Holmes is ready on the 0-2. High, and that will bring the run in to make it 6-5. That is bizarre. I mean, we went two, two games and eight innings without the ball going to the backstop for Tennessee, and it's going to the backstop four times here in the last couple. First wild pitch and first balk of the season for Combs. He needs a strike. Burton needs a bolt. Swing and a miss. And for the first time, Rocky Top reaches the mountaintop of college baseball. They are the World Series champions.